So like I said, if you've already registered or you registered a couple days ago, I sent you guys the part files. So let me know if you guys didn't get them. I think everyone in here right now I've sent them to. So we'll go from there. All right. So I'll get rid of this little thing. Don't need that. All right. So the part file I'm going to look at first is uh, this example one here. Uh, I'll pull them both up so you guys can see what they look like. Uh, here's example one. So we got a, a two op part here. We're going to do both sides. And so we have uh, just some, you know, just some milling. We'll probably do an open pocket to machine all that down. We got this inside pocket here. So my plan is I want to drill a big hole through it and then open it up with a, a half inch or five eighths end mill, something like that. And then inside there, I do have a couple little T slots. So we're going to create a tool that matches the T slot or, you know, it's an eighth inch thick. So we'll get a tool that's an eighth inch thick and we'll actually go in and cut the T slot in there as well. I got this little uh, kind of O-ring groove or whatever you want to call it right there. Uh, and then from the back side, I have just another little pocket, uh, some counterboard holes, and uh, and really just a chamfer on that bottom hole. So we should be able to do most of the stuff from the top side and then, you know, kind of clean up stuff from the bottom. All right, so there's the first part. The second one is the example two here. And it is a larger file, so it might take a second longer to load. There we go. Uh, it's not larger. It's just got a lot going on with it. So we got a lot of pockets, a lot of pockets that end in uh, radius down at the bottom. So our finish tool is going to be probably a, a ball mill for a lot of this stuff. we got some corner rounds, uh, chamfers, depending on whether we do that with the drill or not. And then we have the whole other side of the part, which is uh, a bit more. But most of it should be pretty straightforward we should be able to knock it out um get into some of these areas um these big big sections here depending on the size i haven't taken full measurements of all this yet um you know that's a 1.5 diameter so that might be something that we end up having to do like a 3d milling on to create uh because i don't have a you know, a chamfer tool that's that's got a diameter of one and a half inches. So we'll probably, I might splash a little 3D milling into it. And the reason I'm okay with doing it is because you guys probably have them, but the, the express package, the lowest package of Bobcad that we have uh, does include one three-axis tool path. It's a planar tool path, so it won't be the best for this, uh, but we'll see when we get there. We'll, we'll kind of play it by ear, see where we're going to go with it. So... I'm just going to give it like two more minutes um, just so we can. Uh, I got one more guy who's waiting to load in right now, it says. So just give it one minute and then we'll get started. All right, he's just stuck. So we're going to get started. It's not loading in anymore. So, all right. <coughs> excuse me here we go so here's our part file this is the one we're going to start on so if you guys haven't gotten it to open up let me know uh like i said i emailed everybody so you should have these part files and uh if i go too quick you guys miss anything let me know so i can go back and make sure to uh to do them now one thing i'm going to do real quick it's just the way i like to work on parts is i don't like to have my origin in the middle of the part here I'd prefer it to be on the top level right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go up to evaluate and then measure one. And I just pick any edge that's on the top of this part. So if I pick that edge right there, I can see that my Z is at 0.75. So all I'm going to do is go to utilities and translate. And I'm just going to drop it down in Z minus 0.75. You know the opposite of what it's what it's sitting at now and then i always like to set up my values first you could do this in whatever order you want you could go pick your geometry then set your values i always like to set my values then pick my geometry that way my preview just pops up just immediately and then i can hit okay and then cancel out and so now let me get rid of this arc that i have right here because i don't need that no more oh i'm gonna grab my select tool grab this right there delete all right who just joined who just joined who's the newest one larry mark mike let me see if you just uh registered 
then I have to send you some part files real fast. So let me do. All right. So, Michael, I'm going to send you some part files real quick. Uh, give me two seconds, guys. Let me just forward this email on to Mike. Michael, whatever you go by. I'm Mike, by the way, in case you guys didn't know. Let me copy that address and send it off to you. All right, cool. So it's on its way to you now, Michael. Um, it's just the part files we're using today. Uh, it's got a couple couple little things in it. Uh, so I wanted to make sure everyone's got some part files. This is example number one. There's example number two. They're inside of a zip folder. I gave you two different files, so it should work. All right, so now getting into this. So I want to start off. I'm going to just close down this measure entity box, and we're going to go create some stock. So I'm going to say cam tree. Uh, I've already started a cam tree. Let me delete that. All right. And I'm just going to right click on cam defaults. I'm going to go down to new job. Inside a new job, this is where we get to pick that machine. So either pick your specific machine if you got one, or in my case, I'm just going to use this BC3X mill. This should work just fine. And then from here, I'm going to go right to the stock wizard. So from the stock wizard, the first thing it always asks for is this workpiece. And this workpiece, when you're selecting geometry for this, what you're trying to select is a solid model, always a solid model that represents the final finished part. And essentially what we use this workpiece for is pretty much the simulation. When you open the simulation, you'll get to see a copy of your solid model so you can actually compare what you're cutting to what kind of Bobcat's creating with, with the tool path. So you can kind of see what's, uh, what's left over. So all you do is you pick the solid and then hit next. You don't have to hit OK. If you hit OK, it closes the stock wizard. Um, and then you still have to run your whole stock wizard. So just click it and then hit the next arrow there. And there is our stock dimensions right there. So we can see X is six. I'm good with that. Y is a 6.9282. And uh, that's just from point to point. So I'm going to round that up. We'll say it's seven inches. It's not much extra, but sevens, you know, I could get a piece of stock seven uh, and six inches. Yeah, we'll say it's squared up. Now, a lot of you guys, when you get into this, it's, it facing is a big thing. Um, I have a lot of discussions with guys about how you do facing and all that stuff. And so if you have a known amount that you're going to take off the, the face of your part, you know, you're going to take off 20 thousandths or, or whatever, um, then add your 20 thousandths into here. All right. If you're going to be touching all your tools off of the rough stock, then add that extra geometry into this uh, offset box. So I can say we got 20 thousandths on the top of the part. The way that I usually end up facing, though, is I take a measurement of my stock. And in this case, I need the final dimension to be 1.75. So if my stock was, say, two inches, what I could do is I could load my part into the machine. I could touch off my tools off the rough stock. And then before I set my Z, I drop it down however much, an eighth of an inch if that's what I want to use. Or I could just take off, you know, 20 or 30 thou off the top. And then when I flip it over, I could take off the rest. So the, the way that I do this is I like this surface, all right? So this will be kind of my, my machined surface. I like that to be labeled as my zero plane. That's my Z zero. So when we do this, I don't add extra stock. I rely on myself at the machine to drop the Z down, call it zero. And then when I run my facing pass, it's going to go in and kind of create my zero level. So it, it depends. I'll, I'll kind of show you how it works. If you guys have questions on it, I'll try and explain it better. I have one customer that this is how we do a lot of our facing and it works out really good because you're essentially every time you're doing your face pass, you're creating that zero plane. And it just helps out with a lot of the tool pathing because you got to think if you set your origin 20 thousandths taller and then you face off that 20 thousandths, you have to then remember that every tool path that comes after that has to be negative 20 thou. But by doing it this way, where we're saying our origin is sitting at zero and we're kind of defining the face and at the machine, we're going to set the depth, then everything still starts at zero. Everything's going to run at zero. So when we face this, the top of parts going to be zero and the total depth is going to be zero. So it gets a little weird, but just give you a fair warning now. Like I said, though, you can absolutely leave 
your um, your top of part or your your face material. So if you wanted to leave twenty thou, sixty thou, whatever you got on top of the part, be sure to add it in. And then all your tool paths after the facing has to have that negative amount that you took off. All right. Uh, remember, when you're doing your stock definition, this stock orientation is only going to ever be used if your part's kind of on a weird, goofy angle, and you're trying to orient your stock to match the part, all right? So we're not going to do anything with the stock orientation. We'll just go next, and then right here, we have our machine setup. So machine setup one, yeah, that's the machine setup we're defining, uh, and then we have our origin, and this really depends on where you want to go. Uh, I'll go with the back left corner for now. Uh, if I was going to do, you know, if I already had a hole in it or something, I might pick off the hole if I could. Uh, top dead center on this one wouldn't be a bad option either. It really depends on how you guys are getting your, uh, you know, how you guys are finding zero. If you're using a probe, absolutely. Find the center of the stock. It's going to be just fine. If you're not, you're using a corner, uh, set it up off the corner, whichever corner you want to use. So we set it up on that back corner there. And then the only other change I'm going to make, and you guys shouldn't have to make this, the only time you'll have to make this change is if you have the simulation, the, the pro version of the simulation. So the pro version of the simulation has uh, the ability to see your machine. And so on that virtual machine, we have a defined zero location. And what happens is when we load the simulation, we put our zero location, our origin, in the zero location that's on the machine. So what ends up happening with with a machine showing is the part ends up inside the table and I get errors the whole time telling me that I'm machining through my table. So for me, all I'm doing down here on this work offset X, Y, Z is I'm going to add a Z of uh, the parts about one and three quarters thick, 1.75. So I'll just make it two inches, three inches, whatever I need to lift that part up so it's not inside the table. This does not affect the G code in any way. You could just leave it blank if you want. If you don't have a, a simulation where you see the machine, you don't even have to worry about this. But for those of you that do see the machine in the simulation, you're going to want to add this value so that it lifts the part up. And then right down there, that's our clearance plane. Same clearance plane we always need, always use. Uh, this is where we set it, whether it's a, a drilling, a, a milling, you know, two axes, three axes, whatever it is, this is our clearance plane. If you change this, later on so say we add a few tool paths to the job and then you realize oh, i set my clearance plane way too low i gotta go higher on this you know especially on this specific tool path this does work retroactively so if you change it after you've created tool paths it will update the tool paths that were already created all right so we'll go ahead and hit okay we can't go next anymore so we'll just hit okay and there it is so i have my stock made i'm just going to right click and blank that out and there we go so now coming up with a tool list for something like this is uh, it's this one's not too bad, uh, but I want to do some fun stuff with it. So I want to drill a hole down the middle. And so the first thing I want to do is go to evaluate and just measure one. And I'm just going to measure the diameter of that hole right there. And we'll see the diameter is two inches. That's perfect. What I'm going to end up doing is a uh, I'll do like a one inch drill through that way I can feed. I'm going to use a 5 a end mill. I'm going to feed a 5 a end mill down the center and then have it kind of use the uh, the geometry and then go in and cut the pocket. So we'll, we'll pocket it out. So we have a couple ways of doing that. So we got a one inch drill that we're going to add to the system. So I'm just going to go over here and cancel out, go to my cam tree. I'm going to right click on my milling tools here. We're going to build a full tool crib. I don't want to do this all on the fly because there's a few different tools we need. So I'll say tool crib. And I'm going to start off with a center drill and I'll add from my tool library here. And so this one I'll start with, uh, let's go with, uh, let's see. Oh, let's do a, I, I don't know if I can get a half inch into some of the areas because of the, the hex or the little plus sign kind of thing I got. So let me go with a three eighths, 90 degree spot drill. So I'll hit okay. And really with this one, I only need it uh, technically for this center hole here because I could do all the other drilling from the other side. So everything's kind of, I really don't need to, but we'll start with that three eighths uh, center drill. Next, I'll go back into the tool crib. Let me jump up to the drill section this time. We're gonna add from our tool library and I'm gonna just sort by my diameter here just by clicking it. And if you guys didn't know, they added in this thing, you might have read it before, but it says drag a column header and drop it here to group by that column. 
this is really handy with end mills especially but drills it's it's pretty nice too what you do is you can take the diameter and drag it up into this column and it'll sort by all the diameters and what's cool is it's it's a set diameter so if i expand my one inch drill i only have one one inch drill but if you do this with end mills you might have when you sort by the diameter most end mills you'll have more than you know more than one there's usually a standard version and then a long version but like a half inch end mill has a standard version it has a long version and it has a ball end mill version so when you sort by your diameter or you sort by your label or whatever category you want to sort by it sorts all the tools and you get to see kind of i want to see all my half inch tools and it's going to show you all the half inch tools which is really cool so there's my one inch drill i'm just going to pick it and hit okay and there's my one inch drill that's fine that'll work perfect so while i'm still in here i'm going to go add an end mill rough to this so i'll say add from tool library and then once again this is the end mills this time so i could grab the diameter and sort by that and then this is my full list of all the available diameters that i have in here but if i expand something like a quarter inch here i have a quarter inch standard quarter inch long and a quarter inch ball we don't have a lot of ball mills in here, so you won't get that for everything, but you can always create your own. And as long as the diameter is a quarter inch, it'll get thrown into this category along with it. So I'm gonna go with this five eighths here. Uh, let's see, we got our five eighths flat and the long right there. So I'll pick that and then hit okay. And there's my five eighths and mill. Uh, and then I don't remember the diameter of these corners here and the width of that's a quarter inch. So I'll probably do a, uh, we'll do like a 3 16th that we could use to cut that slot, hopefully. Uh, technically, we could use a quarter inch. Um, we'll do it. We might do it two ways. We'll, we'll see We'll see which way we like more um, because we could get it to do it in kind of two passes or we could get it to do it in one. But I'd, I'd say one of these sides, if we do it in one pass, is going to come out with a worse finish. But let me just grab a dimension off of that guy right there, and we'll see it's... Uh, so that's made for a quarter inch tool. So I can use a quarter inch uh, flat end mill on that. So let me add that one in. Just right click, tool crib. And then again, add from the library. We'll go ahead and expand the mill. I didn't pick end mill before. There's my end mill rough. Again, sort by the diameter if you like. Find yourself your quarter inch. And I'll go ahead and do a uh, quarter inch long right there and hit OK. There's my quarter inch flat long. Uh, then I'll add that three sixteenths in. So I'm just going to go in here. Once again, I, one thing I want to point out, because I just did it twice in a row, is when you're going into the tool library, if you don't pick a specific category on the left, you get the full library. So to make it a little easier, over on the left, I could say, let's do an end mill rough and then add from my tool library. And that way it only opens up the end mill rough category here. So once again, I'll sort by my diameter. I'm gonna go ahead and find a 3 uh, Let's do the long version only because I got a three quarter inch stand up with that little plus sign dealy. And then I'll hit okay. And then we need a chamfer mill. So I need something to chamfer some edges with. So I'll add from the tool library on that. And I'll pick, uh, let's go with a 3 8 chamfer there. And I'll hit okay. Right there, so there's a little, little chamfer. Looks fine, should be good enough. I'm not taking much off on those chamfers. And then the last one is a corner round uh, right out here, uh, but I don't remember what size I made it. And I don't know if this is gonna give me the right measurement. See, it's a spline curve because it's on that corner. So what I need to do real quick is I need to find, uh, it's, I think it's a quarter, I think it's an eighth inch radius, uh, but without knowing for sure, I wanna make sure to pick the right tool. So an easy way to do this is to find the intersection. So just a little bit more CAD, I guess, from, from what you guys might've seen yesterday if you were here, but uh, if the part's you know, kind of in a known location, like I know exactly where that part's sitting, uh, what you could do is under Create 2D, or sorry, Create 3D, there's this option way over here called Intersection Curves. So what we need to use Intersection Curves is we need a plane that intersects our part. So the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna add a new layer, I'm just going to call it plane. And then I'm going to go down to my UCS tab here. So I have my, uh, my, my coordinate system. I'm going to change my coordinate system. I have my top plane here. 
And so I'm going to go to a front plane. And what we'll see is we have this plane now that runs right through here. Now, it seems like a lot of work to get this measurement. There's probably another way, actually. Let me measure one. If I, I can't pick the surface, so it doesn't let me do that. There might be another way. This is, a, this is the way I would do it real quick. So what I did now is I'm now drawing in a different plane. And so if I go to create 2D and I create this planar surface, or in my case, what I'll use is a rectangular plane. Um, the reason I like to use the rectangular plane is because of these options here. It lets me sketch. So I'm just going to sketch a plane that cuts across the entire part like so. Hit OK and cancel out. And then I'm going to add another layer. And this is just where my, my intersection is going to show up. So I'll say intersection curves. And then right here we have our intersection curves. All right, so I pick the intersection curves. I pick my first solid or surface, whatever we want to pick. It doesn't, there's no right or wrong order you pick this in. Then I pick my second. And you can faintly see it. You guys might be able to see it better on your screen, but there is a faint orange preview that shows up all around what's going to pop up here. So what we're getting by doing this is where this plane intersects this surface or solid. So I'll hit OK. I'll cancel out and I'll go turn off all the other layers right there. So that's just kind of a section view of that. Oh, that's another way you could do it. Yeah, section view. It's under the, uh, where is section view nowadays? Under utilities. I haven't used section view in a very long time. Uh, yeah, section view right there. So section view, we might also be able to do it where we say I want to cut it from a top plane or a front plane here. I got to cancel out real quick. There it is. So let me hide my plane and section view so section view technically i could go in uh, pick my solid model and really just tell it to create a wireframe and that could be another thing we do that's probably faster i don't use section plane too often as you can tell but it is another option to create the wireframe but i've been using the intersection curves for so long because for the longest time that's how you created wireframe geometry for turning parts if you were doing a lathe job you'd have to find intersection curves. We didn't have that spun profile feature. So all that work just so I could come in here and measure that radius. So I'm going to go utilities, sorry, evaluate, measure one, pick that arc right there. Let me zoom in, pick that arc, not the points, make sure you get the arc. And we'll see it's, a, it's an eighth inch radius. So I'll go back to my cam tree. I'm going to add another tool to my tool crib. And this one's gonna be a corner round tool. So I'll add from the library. I should have an eighth inch in here. Uh, I'm gonna search by my corner radius here. I'm just gonna drag that up to the top and we'll see right here we have our eighth inch. And so these are all the ones that we have. Uh, we got a half inch with an eighth inch radius. Um, let's see, let's do, uh, let's use that half inch. We'll try that one, see how it works. If it's too big, we could always change it. We got a lot of options here. So we'll pick it, we'll hit okay. And then there is that little corner rounding tool. And when we're all done, we'll hit OK. Now, I think that's all the tools. I definitely need drills and stuff, but those don't happen until we get to the other side. So we shouldn't have to worry about any more drilling right now. Uh, if you wanted to put them into your tool crib, you absolutely could because you might not change tools throughout the job. But um, actually, we might as well put them in. Uh, so I'm going to do a center drill, drill, and tap on that. Um, I'm not going to put them in. Uh, we have our center drill. When we go to do the drill, it's going to pick it when we tell it to tap the holes. It's going to pick a 201 drill for us. We don't have to mess with that. And then the drill or the, the tap itself, it's going to pick the tap. So we just got to really make sure that we got enough slots in our machine to make this happen. You know, right now, I think about seven tools. Um, you know, one of the guys I work with the most often, he's got a, a nine tool. You know, he's got 10 tools, but the probe's in one slot. So he's got nine tools that he could fill up. So we have a, a, some, a couple extra slots. We might run out of spots depending on the machine you have, or you might not even have a tool changer at all. So you got to swap out all these tools as you go. If that's the case, I would look into possibly using one of these end mills more often. Maybe go with a, you know, maybe a three ace end mill or a really three ace is too big to do everything. Uh, your quarter inch would be probably the, the smallest end mill you can go that still has the ability to cut every, or the, I guess the biggest end mill you can create uh, that has the ability to go cut pretty much everything, but we're gonna, we're gonna run it. So we'll hit okay. I'm gonna close down the measure entity box. 
and uh, I'm going to hide that plane that I don't need anymore. All right, so on this one, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to drill, or the first thing we're going to do is face it. So let me start with that one. So I, I talked a lot about facing earlier when I was setting up the stock. I do not usually add the extra material onto the top of the stock. Uh, that's this is the way I do it. You guys definitely don't have to do this. You might have a different way. You might face it off. Before, you might never even use Bobcat to face it off. And if that's the case, do it that way. Get your block squared up and then start. But for me, what I do is when I do my facing, I right click. I say, let's do a, a mill facing. And so it pretty much finds the geometry, kind of looks at it. We may need to select a piece of geometry that's the size of our stock, but it should be recognizing it. So I'll go next. Right here, we have our top of feature and it's set to zero. And our total depth is also set to zero. And the reason it's reading this right now is because Bobcat, if you have extra material on top of your part, it will actually read it and it knows where the material is, knows where it'll, where it'll end. So by leaving my top of feature, my total depth at zero, all I'm gonna do is create this facing tool path. And then at the machine, when I walk out there and I set my Z for my tool, that's the wherever i set z is what's going to be called zero and then we're going to run a face pass across at that level so anything that comes after that is using that freshly faced off top as their top of job to go cut into the part so it's got a square that looks good looks like the piece of stock we have i'm just going to hit next and then give me one second i gotta take a drink By the way, if you guys have any questions, make sure to throw them in the questions box over there. I don't want to throw you guys off with this. Uh, I have I have confused quite a few people with this facing. So if you you know you're not understand what I'm talking about, uh, I'll try to explain it. The simulation might help me out a little bit later. But remember, use that questions box. Ask any questions you guys have, and uh, yeah. So facing, just gonna hit next. Right here is my posting. Got work offset number one. That's my G54, my E1, my first work offset on my machine. And we're going to ignore that output rotary angle. Right here is facing. So it, it grabbed one of the tools I had in my crib. It's not the tool I'm going to use to face. So I'm just going to go up to the tool crib. And I'm going to pick my 5 eighths flat. I'll just use that to face it off. Hit OK. And there it is. So I have my 5 eighths tool, tool number, coolant, feeds and speeds. Now, I'm going to next my way through these windows. If there's anything on a page that you guys don't understand as I go through it, if I go past it, just throw a, throw a note in there. Say, hey, how do you, wh what's that thing for? How do you use this? So um, if you guys have any questions about feeds and speeds, let me know. But over on the right side here for feeds and speeds, right now, Bobcat is calculating those feeds and speeds. And I don't know what material I currently have set up. Uh, it's under the stock over here. Um, but if I'm going to go in and set my own feeds and speeds, I don't need to rely on Bobcad. Then what I could do is I could uncheck the use system feeds and speeds and either do the math myself. So if I know my, well, not really myself, but if I know my surface footage and my chip load, I can enter those values here. If I just know my spindle RPM and my cutting feed rates, then I would just go and enter them in right here. So I could say I want to go 6,000 RPM. I want to run at... Uh, Actually, I'm good with that. 69 and 34. We'll keep it right there. Uh, if you don't have a method of, of figuring out feeds and speeds as of now, um, I strongly recommend looking into some programs that they have out there. Uh, there's some really great ones. G-Wizard, not to just name drop anyone, but they're, it's, it's my favorite. I could go in. I could punch in materials. I could tell it what diameter tool I got tell it my depth of cut. I could tell it my step over. I could give it all that information and then it recommends feeds and speeds. And it's got ranges in it that let you go from being a, a very aggressive cut to a much, um, much less aggressive cut, more conservative. So you can actually vary it. So it's, it's a, a fantastic software that every time I've not listened to it, I've broken tools. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's been really handy so far. It saves me a lot of time not having to figure out and break tools and get the wrong stuff so that program is called g wizard take a look at it it's by cnc cookbook um fantastic program so there's the feeds and speeds just entered some stuff and these are kind of irrelevant but the big thing to remember is when we're setting up feeds and speeds we're looking at the material that shows up over here in the cam tree 
We're also looking at this tool material right here. So if we're the ones setting up the feeds and speeds for you, every tool that you select has, well, every time you create a tool, every time you pick a material, you have three categories for the material of the tool. Uh, by default, we have high speed steel, carbide, and insert cutter. So those are your three options, and they vary the speeds and feeds that you run. So you got to make sure you're picking the right tool. In my case, this would be a carbide end mill, but because I'm defining it myself, we're no longer relying on Bobcat. So the whole thing's kind of, it, it doesn't really matter that much. So I'm just going to hit next. Right here's our pattern. So for facing, you just got a choice of a zigzag. Uh, just go back and forth. You could do a zig where you keep everything moving in one direction, or you could do an adaptive. And the whole thing with adaptive is it's trying to keep a constant engagement with the tool. So it's trying to keep a constant cut as it works around. It's whatever your step over is, it's really focusing on keeping that. And it's keeping that tool in the material the whole time. It doesn't really um, clear off the part too much. The problem I've run into, and I've reported it as it's been reported now, but the adaptive, when you run a face like I am, where there's zero material coming off and there's zero, you know, it doesn't see any material, uh, it doesn't give us an output. So I've reported it, but we're just waiting. So I like to use the zigzag for this one. Uh, I'll go off the workpiece, and then how far off the workpiece do I go? Just half the tool. So I got a five ace tool. I'll divide that by two. Remember, these boxes are all calculators, so you could do your math right there. And then right down here, we'll tell it, uh, yeah, go ahead and do it across the X direction. We'll go back and forth that way. Start at the upper left-hand corner where our origin is. I'm going to set up my step over as uh, we'll just go 40% and then I'll hit next. Right here's my parameter. So if we were leaving material for the bottom allowance, um, we could. I'm not going to. And then our depth is we're always just going to go with a single step because right now we're taking off no material. Again, when you walk out to the machine, you're going to set your Z at the depth of however much material you want to run. So if you're taking off, a sixteenth of an inch. You're going to touch off the top of the part, move over, jog down a sixteenth, and then say, "That's that's my Z zero. And then when you run it, we'll face it. We'll just face off that sixteenth of an inch, and that new level that's created afterwards is going to be our zero. There's other ways to do this as well. Uh, technically, I could on my feature page, if I knew how much I was taking off, I could set my top of feature to, you know, something like a sixteenth, and I could set my total depth to something like a sixteenth. And this would still give us the same result where every tool path we start on after this still uses zero. But that's all because our origin is at the top surface. If this origin moves you know, to the top of the rough stock, that's what's going to give you those changes in you know, whether or not you have to put a negative value on your upcoming tool paths. So again, let me set this guy back to zero. There we go. Uh, all right, we'll go next. Right here's our lead. So you got a vertical lead in or a parallel. I usually use parallel. And again, I just take the tool diameter and divide it by two and uh, use that. It extends it a little bit further, but with facing, I'm usually not too concerned. And then right here we have our links. Just how do we connect from one pass to the next? We can go direct or we can make an arc. And finally, we have the advanced feed rates. So the big thing on here is the convert rapids to feeds. Uh, and really, it's big for any of you guys that have a Haas machine. And some of you guys might have a Haas machine and think, oh, no, this is this is me. Uh, there's a thing that Haas's do called dogleg rapids. Uh, Haas is most notorious for it. Uh, but even I, I've had hundreds of Haas customers that I ask about this, and they've never noticed it. So it might be something that happens, but you guys might not notice it. So essentially what happens is when you rapid from one position to another, so say from this corner here to this corner here, it should be a straight line. And that's how the code should read. It should be a straight line. Uh, but when it's in a rapid mode, so when we kick in a G00 on a Haas, it loses, uh, is it polarity or modality, polarity, something like that. And so essentially the X and Y aren't clocked properly, meaning they don't end up at the right position at the same time. They don't make a straight line to get there. And so what happens is X or Y ends up kind of running a little bit faster than the other. So instead of a straight line, you'd have kind of a curved arcing line, a dogleg rapid. 
is what they call it. So this allows you to, when you, uh, when you check this button, it gets rid of all the G00s zero that sh would normally show up with this facing program. This is a setting that you would turn on uh, on every tool path or inside the machine definition. So inside the actual settings of the, the machine for the software, there's an option that you can tell it that it dog leg rapids. And then you don't have to worry about this on any of your um, tool paths. You can just ignore it. But if, you, if you're doing it just on certain ones, you turn it on and you enter in a feed rate. And that's going to be the feed rate that gets used because instead of outputting a G00 for a rapid, we're going to output a G01 and then output a feed rate so you could run it at whatever speed you want to run it at. So again, if you have a Haas, be on the lookout for it. The only guys I ever really hear about that notice it is if you have fixtures that stick above the top of the part, you know, bolts or anything like that. Uh, I've had some guys where their tool kind of swings into it. And we've done hours of investigating, trying to find out why this kind of stuff happens. And when you look through the code, everything looks fine, but it's actually at the machine it's happening. So uh, again, if you have a Haas, be on the lookout for it. But like I said, I've had hundreds of Haas, Haas customers and not many of them have this issue. So, all right. So your lead in and lead out, excuse me, feed rate percentages. That's a percentage of your cutting feed rate that's going to be used when you do a lead in or a lead out. All right. So you just check this on. So I think I'm going 69 inches a minute right now. So if I was to say on my lead in, go 50 percent i'm gonna go 34 and a half inches a minute instead of 69 so there we go all right finally uh we can't hit next anymore so we're just gonna hit compute and this tool pass shouldn't take too long to calculate but there is our face pass all right so like i said when we go to face this off you're going to if you were doing this part you would manually be setting up where you want to set your Z and then your first pass, when you run it, it's going to take off however much material is above uh, where you Z'd out from. So there you go. So I always like to blank out tool paths when I'm done with them. So I blank it out. I usually rename it, but this one's named feature mill facing. So I don't think we need to rename it. Then I'll go ahead and shrink it up. There we go. All right, now what I want to do is work on this inside pocket real quick. I just want to knock out the hole and kind of do the whole thing here. And uh, so there's many ways to do this drilling, but there's a couple things I'm going to need to do. One thing is I'm going to drill it with a one inch drill, and then I'm going to use an open pocket to clean it up to the two inch diameter that we got. So what I want to do is I'm going to go up to create 2D, and I'm just going to say I'm going to make a new layer here, and I'm going to make it one inch hole. Uh, let me put a space in there. So one inch hole. And I'm going to go to arc and then radius, and I'm gonna set it to 0.5, and it should be centered right on X, Y, Z, zero already for me. And then I'll hit okay and cancel out. So there is my arc. All right, and I'm still clicked on the, uh, the thing there. So there we go. All right, so there's my center arc. Now, before I go and use this as geometry, for open pocketing, there's really one rule you need to follow. And that rule is anywhere there's not a wall, you're going to change to a dotted line. So anywhere where there where there's an open pocket, an open edge, we're going to create that as a dotted line. So since I didn't change my line style, which is right down here, and I could have done it before I drew the arc, I just didn't think about it. Had I drawn it with the uh, dotted line, I wouldn't have to do this, but I need to modify it. So I'm going to grab my select tool. I'm going to pick my arc and then right click. Go down to Modify Attributes, and one of the options in here is Line Style. So I'll pick that one. I'll choose my dotted line there, and I'm just going to hit OK. So the drilling doesn't get affected by dotted lines. And really, with drilling, I could pick any hole or point as long as it's in the right location. So for my drilling function, technically, I could have just picked this arc right here and then just changed to a one-inch diameter uh, just change it to a one inch diameter. But by having this, it's kind of allowing me to drill the hole as well as set up the geometry for the pocket uh, when we do the open pocket. So I'm going to right click on machine setup one. I'm going to go down to mill drill hole and I'm going to select my geometry. Now the geometry is just going to be this one arc right there and I'll hit OK. And so we'll see it reads the diameter as one inch. You'll see the depth is read as a half inch, but we can go in and say pick bottom. 
Now this is the one, you gotta make sure that you flip this part over or pick this bottom edge. If you reach through the hole and you just pick that edge there, you gotta remember there's a pocket on this side. So I wanna make sure I go deep enough to really get all the way through this pocket if I can. Uh, it's 1.75 thick. The 5 ace tool I'm using should be fine to reach you know, down through there, but that'll make it so that when I do this pocket here, I can start in the middle in a cleared out section and then work these walls in. So I got my one inch uh, drill going, so I'll hit okay. I got the depth picked, hit okay. We'll see it's 1.75. And remember, if you leave the through hole option on, we add an amount onto your drill. It's the amount, whatever set up inside your cutting conditions. By default, it's 50 thousandths. So when we get to the end, when we look at our overall or our, our uh, there's two depths. We have our overall depth and our, uh, all right, we'll see it in a minute. I'm blanking on the other word. Uh, the overall depth is where the tip of the tool is going to go. And then we have our effective depth. That's what it is. So our effective depth should read as a 1.8 when we get there later on. So because I'm telling it, it's a through hole. So I'll go next. Right here, we got our group retracts. So this is where we're retracting from. So just, just your clearance plane, essentially one inch high. Hit OK. Uh, top of features at zero. Total depth 1.75. It is a through hole. So I'll say next. Right here, we'll choose the hole option, which gives us a center drill and a drill. If uh, any of you guys don't use center drills, all you got to do is click on it and hit that little red X and you can take it out. So you're running just your drill. Uh, but I did set up a center drill in here. So I'm going to choose the hole uh, section again, and that'll give me my center drill and drill back. Uh, you could also, uh, not right now, but on features where your geometry is the same, whether it's you know this drilling and then we go into milling, if the geometry is the same, we can combine features. So if all I was doing was drilling a one inch hole, then I wanted to chamfer it. We could absolutely add a chamfer mill right into this, but we'll do that when we do our pocket. So we'll just hit next for now. And we get to our machine sequencing. Uh, with the sequencing for just about everything, when I'm working on this stuff, I, I pretty much use optimized uh, for everything because what optimized does is it picks kind of the, the optimal settings for drilling or for the order that it goes in. But the way that it does it is by kind of looking at all the rest of them. It looks at closest, the pick order, the X direction and the Y direction, and it picks the most efficient one out of those four. If you're ever doing a, a set of holes that you're drilling and you have a very specific order that you wanna cut them in, you can do that by using pick order. And it's pretty cool how you pick them. I'll do it later on when we get to the smaller holes because I only got the one hole right now, so it won't matter too much. But you can actually say pick and then you just kind of drag your mouse. You click and drag your mouse around the screen and it'll actually grab all the holes in the order that you touch them in. But like I said, I'm going to use optimize. There's, there's only one hole, so there's no right or wrong on this one. And then I'll say next. All right, here's my posting. Got work offset number one. Go next again. Got our center drill, so it picked that 3 8 90 degree spot drill that I set up. So I'll go next. Right here, we have our center diameter for our center drill. So you can either set up the depth of the drill that you want to go. So if you know what that is, you could set that up. Or you could tell us what the center diameter is. And so I like to use the center diameter. I could come in here and say, I want to go, I want the center diameter when it's done to be a quarter inch. And so we'll see that 90 degree spot drill has to go an eighth inch deep to get there. Over here, we then have our uh, cycle type of packing or fast packing. I can't remember if this was in 32, if this is new to 33. Um, any, if any of you guys are using 32, uh, this option may not be in there, but again, I'm not 100% sure. So it's something, you know, as you look at your page, see if it's there. Uh, it just lets us pack our spot drill. So just gonna go in, tell it what to pack by. Uh, should be using 50% um, of the tool, I believe. I don't know how, I'll have to look at the cutting conditions, but for now, I'll just hit next. Let me see, there we go. All right. Two seconds, guys. All right, so this is our one inch drill. Because I put it inside my library or inside my crib, uh, it already grabbed it, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, just gonna hit next. 
right here's my parameters so like i said whenever we do a through hole we add 50 thou onto it we're going 1.75 deep plus 50 thou brings us to that 1.8 that's where you're going to get a full width cut full shoulder width cut one inch all the way down the overall depth is where the tip's going to go that's the number you should expect to see inside your code because that's the one where yeah you know, that's the that's the depth that the tip's going to go so it's adding on that extra you know 300 thousandths for just the tip of the one inch drill uh once again you can choose whether you want to peck or fast peck with that one uh this one's definitely set to 50 percent of the cutting or of the tool diameter so this center drill looks like it might be it's a bit smaller broken down into three steps i, I don't know where it came up with those numbers but this one takes 50 percent of the tool diameter and that's each peck and that's a setting inside your cutting conditions of the cam defaults. If you right click on here and go down to cutting conditions, there's a pecking option of what percentage we use by default per peck. All right. So when we're all done with that, we can't hit next anymore. We'll hit compute. Pretty straightforward. It's a one inch drill. It's done. So I'm going to blank it out and then shrink it up. And the cool thing is, and you guys might notice this as you guys go through parts and, and do work. Uh, eventually it starts to speed everything up after you start creating a couple tool paths, a lot of stuff ends up being able to get, you know, copy and pasted. So when we do the open pocket for this inside section, we will be able to do a copy and paste and do it for the outside as well. So we could actually start from this wall here and work out to the stock all the way out here, or really, uh, what we'll probably do is generate a, uh, a wireframe piece of this stock here, and we'll have it do an open pocket that way. That way we get rid of all the stock around here. Um, yeah, that'll probably be how we do it. Cause then when we flip the part over and we start facing, you know, when we start working on the other side, we'll be able to grab onto this kind of plus sign to hold on to, flip it over. And then we could even do our finish pass or our, uh, what you call it, our, um, our profile pass around the outside. I really need to do a little bit of a profile pass on this side as well, though, too. So we'll play it by ear. We'll see how it goes. So, all right, center pocket. That's it. So we have our dotted line geometry. And then this other edge that we're going to use, we're going to use this edge right here. That's going to be the wall we want to stop at. So I'm going to right click on machine setup one. I'm going to go down to mill two axis and then select geometry. Now, when I select the geometry, I'm going to pick that arc and any one of these inside wall arcs it doesn't matter which one you just pick one of them all right and so our total depth we know that the part's 1.75 so i'm just going to do the uh the same thing we did before i'll go 1.8 inches deep that way we get it to stick out a little bit on the bottom cut all the way through so that when we go to clean up that pocket later on we'll have a nice place to start so the benefit of doing an open pocket instead of like a, a straight pocketing is I'm going to get Bobcad to ignore this one inch of material that's there. It's also going to start inside that area. It should see it as a safe area to plunge the tool. So we should be able to use vertical leads on all of that. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is on the finish pass of this thing, I want my tool to plunge right down the center, feed to the wall, and then cut. So I have some very basic math that we can do with do that with uh, on this one. So we'll, we'll see it all come together. Uh, all right, so we'll hit OK. And then I'm gonna hit Next. So we have our top of feature at zero. We're going that 1.8 deep. Next again. I'm gonna choose Pocketing. Now remember the geometry that I just selected and really the geometry we wanna focus on as kind of the, the real selected geometry is the solid line, not the dotted line. Um, the dotted line shouldn't be run. We're gonna try and add, uh, what I'm gonna try and do is add a chamfer mill to this. We're gonna see the results. It shouldn't do anything on the dotted line. Like it shouldn't try and chamfer the dotted line. Um, but if it does, we'll have to make a chamfer on its own, just its own feature. But for now, what I'm gonna try and do is combine it with this pocket and profile finish. So I'll say chamfer mill, move that over. So we have our pocket, our profile finish, and our chamfer mill, and then I'll go next. Right here's our tabs. Now we're cutting a pocket. I'm not going to leave any tabs. There's normally with a tab you'd be using it to keep an area that stays uncut, so your part doesn't fall out or you know drop anywhere. Uh, in this case, internal pockets. I'm not messing with that. So I'll go next. 
For the posting, got our work offset number one once again, and then our contour ramping output. Now, this doesn't affect this toolpath. Uh, it is a toolpath we're going to play with later on, but the contour ramping output is specifically for the profile roughing toolpath. Uh, profile rough has a pattern called a contour ramp where as the tool's cutting around the part, say an X, Y, it's also plunging down in Z. So it's doing this contoured ramp down the part. And all this is asking is whether or not we're allowed to output the code with line moves or arc moves. So it doesn't even affect this one. It's just one of the settings that's always there. So we'll go ahead and hit next. Right here, once again, I don't know how it decides to pick which tools. It's never, it's, it's, if you have a tool crib, it always just picks tools. Uh, if you don't set up a tool crib, it'll just fill it in with a half inch tool. So I'm going to go into the tool crib. And I'm once again going to pick my 5 ace flat, hit OK. There it is. So I'll go next. Right here for my patterns. All right, there's two pocketing patterns that we have. There's a standard pocket and an advanced pocket. Whether or not you're using the standard or the, or standard or the advanced, you do also have this option here called Use Spiral for Circular Pockets. So if you have a circular pocket, you can make Bobcad convert that from you know your standard linked tool path to just a spiral. The thing about standard pockets, and this is the big thing to remember, is they are not allowed to do open pocketing ever because they don't recognize the dotted line geometry the same way. But advanced pockets can. So standard pocket, you have parallel, offset in, and offset out. Well, so does advanced pocket. You have parallel, offset in, offset out. Did that in the wrong order. You have your morph spiral and then your adaptive roughing or your high speed machining strategy. So for me, I don't use standard pockets ever anymore because yeah, they can't ever leave the part. They're not allowed to. Uh, so even if you give them a dotted line, they can't leave that, but the advanced pocket can. So if I give the geometry as a dotted line, then the advanced pocket can open pocket it but it's all based on the geometry that I give it. So if I don't want it to do an open pocket, I don't make the geometry dotted. I just leave it as solid lines. And really I just use advanced pockets for everything now, whoops. So I'm gonna go with, uh, on this one, uh, I'll go with an offset pocket out. We'll see how it comes out. Yeah, I wanted to start on the inside and work its way out, but I want to just turn on this option, use spiral for circular pockets. Why not? We'll see if it can make a spiral. Down below that, we have our cut direction. So you have a climb mill and a conventional mill. Uh, so I'm going to tell it I want a climb mill. And then right here, we do have some rest roughing options. If you guys haven't played with rest roughing before, essentially what it does is it allows you to go in. Well, let me start from the beginning. Essentially what it does is you'd have two pockets one pocket with a large tool and one pocket with a smaller tool. You would program the large tool just like normal. There's no fancy options to that one at all. But when you get to the second pocket and you switch to a smaller tool, so maybe we start out the job with a half inch and then on the second one, we, we drop down to a, a three eighths or a quarter inch tool. The rest roughing allows me to go in and tell Bobcad what I've already cut this area with. So what tool did I already use? And all you do is say, I've already cut it with a half inch tool. Uh, it was a flat bottom, so there was no corner radius. And I left uh, you know, 15 thousandths for my allowance. So when you do run this, you know, we'd be working on a pocket that now has a, a quarter inch tool in it. So when I calculate it, it's gonna take a little bit more time to calculate, but what it's doing is it's figuring out where that half inch tool would have fit and where it should have cut. And then it's only gonna output the tool path in the areas where that previous tool couldn't fit. So it works out really good for working corners into a pocket or just working smaller and smaller tools into your part. It does extend the calculation time. Uh, I've had guys that will, they'll make eight pockets and they'll start at a one inch end mill and they'll work down until they're at like an eighth inch end mill. And they'll have, you know, work, you know, everything references the previous tool. So they go from a one inch to a three quarter to a half inch to whatever. And so when they do that, everything's referencing that previous tool. And so when you hit compute on that, it will take a, a bit a bit longer to run. But uh, I usually don't go too crazy with it. I might do a large tool, a medium tool, and a small tool, kind of three tools to work together. Uh, and that seems to work pretty good. So turn off the rest roughing. 
over here is our step over. Now, it all depends on how you plan on milling this thing. Um, we have a hole in the middle. So we do have the ability to potentially plunge to the bottom of the hole and then spiral our way out. Just use the whole side of the tool to clean up the full 1.75. And if I was going to do something like that, then I definitely don't want a 50% step over. I'd be something closer to like 10%. But yeah, you know what? I'll do 10%. We'll see what it comes out looking like. What I may need to do is I might need to make that arc in the middle a little bit smaller so we can step away. I just don't want this tool to plunge into the material, which it shouldn't, but just in case. So I'll put that at a 10% step over, nice fine step over, and I'll hit next. So the allowance, this is what we're going to leave for the finish pass on the walls. That side allowance, 15,000, leaving that for the finish tool to clean up. We got the bottom allowance. I'm not leaving anything there. I want it to finish the part. And then down below, we have our depth. And so this is where we have to kind of think about it a little bit more, um, whether we want to do a single step or whether we want to do multiple steps. So this could affect the last page a lot. I mean, we don't have to go with a 10% step over if we decide to take this out at a, a quarter inch at a time or a hundred thousandths at a time. Um, but I think I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it as a single step. I'm going to run it. If we don't like it, excuse me, we could change it. We could always, you know, turn these options on. Let's see what we get. And uh, we'll go from there. I picked a five ace tool because it's a pretty tough tool and, uh, you know, should do fine. We'll see. So I'll leave it on single step for now. Hit next. Right here's our leads. I'm going to leave it on plunge for this one because, again, with that open pocket, it should be plunging into an area that's safe to plunge into. It's an opened up area. Uh, it's been drilled out already. So I'll try it with a plunge. If we need to, we could ramp or spiral in whatever we need to do. So from there, we'll go next. Right, here's our machine sequencing. I, like I said, optimized, whenever I'm doing anything that has to do with sequencing, I turn on optimized and you'll notice you have machine sequencing here, here and here. Uh, so turn on optimized and then say apply to all operations. All right, and then next, right here's our links. How do we connect from one pass to another? Do we go with a direct kind of line across the surface? Do we make an S link? And then we could also do a full retract. Uh, with this one, though, I shouldn't really have to worry too much with uh, the pocket because I turned on, uh, what was it? The use spiral for circular pocket. So I shouldn't have any uh, links. So I'll, I'll just leave them on direct. Right there's my advanced feeds. And... Let's see. Oh, yeah, we added the corner slow down. So you have your your uh, convert rapids to feeds. That's that option I was talking about earlier with the dog leg issue. You got your feed rates for linking and then your adaptive feed rates. Now, the adaptive feed rates, you actually get more than this if you are getting, uh, if you're using the high speed machining, the adaptive roughing, you'll get a volume based and then you'll get radial chip thinning. And it's all about just varying the feeds and speeds of the machine as it's running. Uh, basically to make sure we get the same size chip off the part. That's a radial chip that he's trying to do. The volume base is looking at the, the amount of engagement that the tool has at any given time, and it'll speed up and slow down uh, based on that engagement. In this case, because we're not using the, the exact high speed strategy, uh, the only thing we could do is slow it down. So if it encounters a bit more engagement than, you know, than it wants, when it gets into a corner, uh, it'll slow the tool down. But we also have corner slowdowns here. Uh, corner slowdowns allow you to go in and slow the tool down as it cuts your corner. So you tell it the distance from the corner and then the percentage of your feed rate that you'd want to run while it runs that corners. Uh, while it runs that corner. All right. Give me two seconds. Let me take a drink. My throat's dry. All right, sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> All right, so that's our corner slowdown. We're not going to run that right now. Going to go next, and now we get to our finish tool. 
So whenever you do a finish pass, like if, if profile finish is really the only one I could think of that's a, a full fledged like finish pass. Um, you can either pick a new tool, or in my case, I would use that same five A send mill. So I'm just going to go up to the tool crib, pick tool number one once again, and hit OK. And you'll see it, it usually picks a half inch end mill. If you don't have something in that category, it'll pick a half inch end mill. So I'll go next. All right here's our patterns. So for a finished pass, we ain't got much. We got a standard pattern. So it's just going to go around the part. And then we have our compensation. Um, so we have two forms of compensation, system compensation, meaning we are offsetting the tool. We are the ones compensating the tool. So for our 5 ace tool here, we're going to be offset by half that diameter. Uh, 3, 1, 2, 5, what is that? 3 eighths? No, not 3 eighths. 3 sixteenths, 5 sixteenths, something like that. I don't know. So it's going to offset by whatever the radius of the tool is automatically. The machine compensation is going to output that G41 or G42 probably G41 into your code so that you can choose so that you can adjust the tool while it's running. So if you're cutting pockets and they're coming out a little too small, well it could mean that your tool's worn. And so you need to comp it, make it a little bit bigger so it, you know, offsets in. I like to run both of them uh, just because then I'm automatically compensated for and my, uh, I have the ability to do the adjustment. The biggest rule of thumb you got to follow whenever you use machine compensation is uh, vertical leads do not work properly. Uh, it doesn't output the G41 if you do a vertical lead. There's ways around that. And if you're interested in that, um, I, we could talk about it later on. I got to figure it all out. There's ways to do it with a ramp setting. But um, if you are interested in using a vertical lead and getting your G41 to come out, there is a way to get it to ramp uh, in and still give you the G41. Um, but I haven't done it in a while. So for me, the rule of thumb is just pick anything but vertical. So I got them both turned on. I'll hit next. Right here's my parameters. So this is the allowance. Once again, this is a finish pass. So I ain't leaving any allowance. I'm going the full 1.8 deep. All we're doing is taking off that 15 thousandths. So I'll go next again. And right here we get to our leads. So I do want to plunge in and I do want to plunge in vertically but I need to plunge in. I want to plunge it down the center. So I want to plunge right down the middle of the hole, feed over to the wall, and then make a cut. And I don't really need to. This is a big enough hole that I don't have to do that. But I like to show you guys how to set this up. So the hole diameter is two inches. And I'm cutting it with a 5 8 tool. So if you ever want to find the exact center of your, of your arc or of the hole that you're cutting, uh, and then you can use whatever. I'm going to use a right angle lead. What you do is you take your diameter, so two inches, and you subtract your tool diameter. So I'm going to get rid of the uh, 5 eighths. So I'm left this with this 1.375. Now that's the amount of material that's kind of left over, you know, after we subtract that tool. But we need to split it so that's even on both sides. So all we do is divide this number by two. So you take your whole diameter, you subtract your tool diameter, and then whatever the result is, divide it by two. And so that 0.6875 should be right in the middle of the hole. So we're going to plunge right down the middle. We're going to feed over to the wall. We're going to make our cut and we're going to feed back to the center and then leave. And there we go. So we'll hit next. Right here's our corner types. This is an option that I've, I've really just never changed. So I'll just say next again. I, I don't even know what to tell you guys about that one. Just ignore it. Uh, if you ever think there's a reason to use it, uh, Give us a call. I'd like to know what your plans are with it. So next again, uh, machine sequence, it's already set to optimize because earlier I used this apply to all operations button. So it matched all the leads for or all the machine sequencing pages for me. Right here's my advanced feeds. we got our corner slowdown. And then right here's our chamfer mill. So it's got our three ace chamfer. So I'll go next. Right here we have our uh, machine and system compensation. Once again, I do like to use a G41 any chance I get. Right here's our parameters. So cutter positions the offset of your tool uh, so that you're not running the same spot every time on the, on the tool. It's going to offset the tool off the wall a little bit. Uh, and it's reading all the information from the tool previously. So the small diameter that I have on here is an eighth of an inch. That is what it says right there on that, that small diameter page. So uh, I'm good with that. Chamfer angle 45 degrees. It's a flat bottom tool. 
And then we have three ways of cutting our chamfers in. Either chamfer depth, chamfer length, or chamfer width. So I usually use the depth uh, just because I could go in and say pick bottom, and I could just pick the bottom edge of the chamfer there and hit OK. And so we'll see that's a 0 0.0442. And uh, yeah, that's what we'll try it as. We'll see what it runs like. You can also do multiple steps with this. So right now I'm going to do the whole thing in one pass. Uh, 40 thou, not too worried about it. Or yeah, 44 thou. But you could also do it in multiple steps to kind of work your way in. So if you're doing a much larger, more aggressive chamfer, instead of taking it off in one pass, you could do multiple passes. I'll go with single. Right here's our leads. Uh, for this one, I'm not, I don't have to get too crazy with it, but if I want to start from the center again, I could do a right angle, two inches minus the three eighths for the tool. And then I could divide that by two, just like so. And so when I'm done, I'll hit compute or actually I'll hit next. We got the machine, sorry, corner types, machine sequencing, and then the advanced feeds. There we go. So we can't hit next anymore. We'll hit compute. And uh, it'll take a second to load, so we'll give it a second. I'll take a break and drink something. And if we zoom out of here, whoops, there we are. So right down the middle, that's our, uh, our tool path. We can see that line right there in the center. That's our lead line for the um, finish pass. And then we have our chamfer up top there again, right, right to the center. So I'm just going to blank all this out right there. And then I'm going to rename it. So I'm going to call this center hole size up. Uh, let's go two inch. There we go. So we know what size it is. Perfect. Shrink that up. That's how I know that I'm kind of done working on that tool path for right now. Now I might not be done with that. I still got to simulate it, make sure everything's good, but let's, we'll knock out kind of all the stuff we got to do and then we'll check out the simulation. So there it is right there. So we got that center pocket made. We have those two uh, T slots in there and I did not create a tool for that. I just realized um, we'll do those in a little bit. Let's get the rest of this thing kind of knocked out. Now, the big thing is that that uh, pocket that we just created is a fine pocket. It works great. It's going to do fine for the outside as well. Uh, the thing is, I don't remember where I made what size my stock was because I did make it a little bit bigger. Um, so I want to make sure I get the right size stock, but we have a trick to this. So what I'm going to do is over here in my layers, I'm going to add a new layer and just call it stock. All right. Now, when we do this, if I right click on where it says machine setup one and I say edit, this box pops up around my geometry right here. And uh, one of the options that we have, and I will say, if you guys are using version 32, there was a build of it. If you haven't updated to the, to the final build, there was a build of it that this was broken on. So just make sure you're on the newest build of the system. Uh, if you need us to send a link, I could send you a link. But what we have is an option here called keep bounding geometry. So I can click that and I'll just hit OK. And what we'll see is those points stay on the screen afterwards. So if I go and hide all this other geometry right quick, there's all the, the points and everything I had for that stock. So what I could do is I could go and I'm just going to pick all four of these top lines here. One, two, three, four. So those are the pieces I'm going to keep. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag a box over the whole thing and then delete them. Everything else was going to get rid of all of it. So now I have this, this rectangle that represents kind of the edge of my stock. So I'm just going to go in and uh, make that a dotted line, really. So I'll cancel out, grab my select tool. I'm just going to hold shift and click on the uh, edge there. And then I'm going to right click down to modify attributes line style dotted okay so now when i go to machine this part let me let me rename this layer real quick all right there's the solid hide that hide that all right i don't think i have anything on that layer do i i don't have anything on here that i know of 
Oh, it's because it's my first layer. Won't let me delete it, will it? Probably not, right? Delete that layer. Ah, oh, forget about it. I don't care. All right, so there's the solid back on. All right, so we have the solid here. And then we have our stock right there. So we have two ways of picking the geometry on this. There's kind of the, um, I, I would say the right way and the, and the other way. Uh, the right way for me would be to go extract the edges. That's how I like to do it because it gets, it gets, it lets it, it's a piece of geometry I could pick over and over again if I need to. Um, but you could absolutely also just pick the solid model. So what I'll do is uh, we'll put all the geometry. Uh, let me rename this stock layer. I'll call it stock open pocket. All right. So there it is. So now I can go in. I'm going to go to create 2D, extract edges, and I'm going to tell it to project the geometry to the Z plane of zero. So it projects it flat to zero. And all I'm going to do is pick this surface right here and hit OK. And then when I cancel out, I can go ahead and turn off the solid here. And there is the geometry. Now, that arc that came with it, I don't need that. So I'm just going to grab my select mode. I'm going to pick this arc right here. Oh, it's broken into a bunch of pieces. I'm going to hold shift and then pick the arc right there and then hit delete. And there is my geometry. So I think I got enough on here that I, I should be able to, the, the five ace is going to leave some meat in the corners there, but I'm pretty sure the quarter inch tool should be able to clean them up. That's what I got to use to clean up those edges anyway. So we'll find out right now. So I'll go cam tree. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pocket that we already made because it is an advanced pocket. It's even got the chamfer mill on it. So I should be able to use that. The only real change I'll need to make is I need to go pick a different finishing tool. I'm gonna have to change that tool. So I'm gonna copy this feature by right clicking. I'll say copy. I'll minimize it. And then I'm just gonna paste it. All right, now it's gonna ask if I wanna use the same top and depth. This is one of the things that if, if I'm lucky enough to use the same depth, I'm gonna hit yes. But if I know I'm gonna change my depth, it doesn't matter which one I pick. When I go to pick the geometry, I'll get a chance to set my depth again. So it's not that big of a deal. So for now, I'll just say yes. But you, if you hit no, you get pretty much the same results. So when you copy and paste the tool path, uh, you'll see everything stays the same. The name of it even stays the same. So now I need to rename this. I'll just call it stock open pocket. All right. So we renamed it. Now we need to pick the geometry. So I'll right click on the word geometry and say reselect. And you'll know you need to pick geometry. And there's a big sign, that little red plus sign that pops up to the left of the word geometry is telling you that it's not selected. This can get kind of confusing. Most of the features you run, you know, for two axes, drilling, three axes, all that stuff. When you have a plus sign next to geometry, it means the geometry hasn't been picked. Um, in the next coming years, I would expect this, I, I expect this system to get smarter and smarter all the time, like it has been for the past few years. And that's where something like the, um, the facing toolpath comes in, where we didn't pick any geometry for the face, it just looks at the stock size, and it runs it off that. So you'll see the word geometry there has no, uh, it has the plus sign next to it. Some features don't need geometry. Um, most of them do, but like the facing feature, and really off the top of my head, the facing feature is the only one I could think of that really doesn't need geometry. It just reads the stock. So just be aware, you, there's some features, and I, I'd expect more in the future where you don't pick geometry. It's going to get smarter and smarter and hopefully do this. Uh, eventually, I want this to do it for me. I want to be able to hit a button and say, cut, cut this part, and it'll do it. Uh, that'd be amazing. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but you know, when you see a plus sign, make sure the feature that you're working with needs geometry selected. We can pick geometry for the facing toolpath. Absolutely. Uh, so it's not going to hurt anything if you do pick geometry. It's just that you don't have to. So shrink that back up. But for a pocket, a copy and pasted toolpath, odds are you're going to have to pick geometry for it because you have to. So I'm going to right click on geometry and say reselect. And uh, I'm just going to hold shift and pick both these shapes. You could drag a box over it as well. But if you drag a box, you never get the opportunity to really see if there's bad geometry. By holding shift and, and clicking on it, if the chain stops without completing a, a full lap around the part, 
then we know something's wrong with the geometry. It could be duplicates. It could be overhangs. There could be a hundred different things that cause problems for this. Um, but by holding shift and clicking, if it chains all the way around, that's a good sign that you have a good piece of geometry. So now with that solid model, I'm just going to turn it on. Top of features at zero. I'll say the total depth goes down to right here. Any edge that you want to pick that represents the full depth or in our case, three quarters of an inch, that's what you're gonna set up. So I'll go ahead and hit okay on that. And then the only other change I'm gonna make is I wanna make sure my finish tool can clean up that corner. Uh, it's a quarter inch tool. So I'm just gonna right click on my profile finish here, say edit, I'm gonna go to the tool crib, and then I'm gonna go ahead and choose my quarter inch flat end mill, hit okay. And then I'm just gonna hit compute. That's the only change I'm going to make. And there it is. So we, we have some options on here as well. Um, we don't have our finish pass go to the correct side. Let me look at this real quick. So if I look over here, if I go to default chain start point, remember everything I've done so far, and, and I'm sure most of the things you guys do, we want to climb those. So we want our compensation always set to the left, which this toolpath is set to the left. The thing is, if we left click on where it says default chain start point, again, that's a left click, not a right click. All right. So if we left click on it, all it does is it highlights it. There's our start point on that edge. And if you compensate to the left of that start point, well, you could see the two lines right there. There's the leads. But if I turn off the solid, there's our toolpath on the inside of that thing there. So what I could do is I can reverse it. So I'm just gonna right click on where it says default chain start point. And you could just reverse the direction. Uh, I don't like where it's starting at. I don't like it being on the corner there. So instead of just reversing the direction and fixing it, I'm gonna go to modify, which modify allows me to come in and pick uh, like this edge here. And then it's still going backwards. So I could either go into here and find the chain, which is chain one and reverse it using this little button here or I could just click the tip of the arrow, just like that, and it'll flip it to the other side. Uh, so while I'm here, I'm also gonna change one other thing. I'll edit this guy. I'm gonna do my leads for the profile finish. I'll give it something circular. So I'll just do, uh, it's a quarter inch tool. I'm gonna go with a quarter inch length and radius. Should be plenty big. And then I'll hit compute. And there's our finish pass there. We still have our chamfer going up at the top. I didn't change anything on that. It could be too big. Uh, really, with chamfers, I gotta. I'm, I'm gonna watch the simulation and and gauge it from there and see if I'm even on the right track anyway. But there it is, right there. So all those rapids should be up over the part by whatever our rapid plane is. So in this case, it should be two hundred thousandths, and uh, there it is. So that's gonna take the square to the plus sign. And then um, mm, next thing I guess we'll do is uh, let's let's do, I don't want to cut this fully off. Uh, I got to think if I was holding this in a vise, I really don't even have it oriented the right way for the dang vise. I should have rotated it 90. Thanks for saying something, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, that should be fine. We take off all that material, we'll be able to hold on to that stock that's still down there. So we'll end up doing a lot of the same cuts from the other side. Um, cleaning it up. The only thing I could think is we may need to do a pass, just maybe just a single pass around the outside of this, because I have that that corner round on there. So I have to get that corner round. Otherwise, we make it like a three op part. We cut the top, we cut the bottom and we flip it back over and cut the top. I don't want to do all that. So what we'll end up doing is uh, we'll, we'll probably do another cut. But let's let's focus on this little section here. This little guy, this little groove here. So stock open pocket is done. I'm going to right click on that and say blank on blank. We could shrink that up and then we can go and hide that layer's worth of geometry because we don't need to see it. All right. So this little slot here, this is a little tough one, um, but we'll give it a shot, see what we get. So this one's pretty much just a profile. I wouldn't use a pocket on this um, just because we could use a two axis tool path. And if you guys want to, if you want to get kind of fancy with it, you could have it kind of ramp its way down and then cut its way around. If you wanted to do something like that, though, you'd actually draw the ramp. 
Um, essentially, you'd have an arc that runs right down the middle of this thing. And then you would have uh, a line that that tells it how to cut it. And you wouldn't use a two axis tool path. You'd use a three axis wireframe. Uh, won't get too crazy. I want to try and use that later on today. Uh, let's go here. We're going to do our mill two axis. And so when we select our geometry for this, I'm just going to pick this edge here all the way around. So I'm going to right click and then I'll say uh, loop selection. And then I'm going to hover over the other edge, right click and say loop selection. And it should try and find, or let me say constant Z. I'm so, oh, I got to pick it first. There we go. So loop select that. And then on the other side, I'll do just a constant Z. It should grab the full Z. So I'm going to tell it to machine between these two right here. Give me a second. I got someone messaging me. All right. So there it is. So now I have my, uh, my part here. Big thing I got to do now is I don't want to start this. I don't have to. Uh, I could, but I don't need to start this one at zero. All of this material down to this level is machined off. So the top of part I'm going to say is right to there. The depth that I'm going to go is down to the bottom of this pocket right here. So it's just an eighth inch deep right there. So now I'll hit OK. Oh, wait, before I hit OK. Sorry, I don't want to jump too far. So the last time when I was picking the geometry for that plus sign, I didn't pay attention to my start points on the on the job. So this one, I'm going to go over here and say chain one and chain two. So chain one has a start point of uh, it's over here. I'm going to move it and say just just move the start point there. And for chain two, I'll move the start point there. Now, if we look at these again, we're always compensating to the left. So if we were to compensate to the left of this guy, that puts us inside here. So that's wrong. So we're going to click the tip of that arrow. So to the left puts us on the inside. And then we have our other one, which to the left puts us on the inside. So that one's good. Now we can hit OK. And then hit Next. Right here's our feature. We're just going that eighth inch deep. Uh, machining strategy. I'm going to use a profile rough with a profile finish. And go Next again. Right here's our tabs. We're not going to leave any tabs. Right here's our posting. No real changes for that. Right here we have our tool, and that's actually the one I want. Uh, we got our 3 16 flat end mill. Uh, so we'll go ahead and hit next again. All right, so right here for the patterns, we have a couple options. So a standard cut is just going to go around the pocket. Later on, we will have a leads page as well where we can set up kind of a ramp, and then you could tell it a length that you want to use. Or in this case, we could leave our maximum length off and play with it. But We'll see how we how we decide to do it. Another option could potentially be the contour ramping. So contour ramp, as it cuts its way around the pocket, it's plunging down in Z. So with this being a slot and the fact that we're going to be 100%, you know, our, our tool is going to be buried the full time we're doing this, at least on the first pass, maybe using a contour ramp is not a bad. We're going to try it. We're going to see what it does. So we're going to try this contour ramp uh, compensation to the left. Uh, the machine sequence or machine compensation starts to get a little bit tough here because we potentially might not have a lot of space to really fit the tool. But just remember, because we have the system compensation, the the lead that we create later on, the compensation is already taken care of. All we need to do is give it a lead that's that's large enough so that when the tool comes down, it's during that, you know, as that tool's leading in, when your machine actually applies the compensation, we just need to make sure there's a lead that can tell it to apply the comp. Uh, so I will turn it on and then I'll say next. Uh, right here's our side allowance. So I'm taking 15 thousandths, I'm leaving 15 thousandths. So one of the biggest problems people run into when you're working on either small pockets or grooves like this is you have to account for your side allowance. So the tool is uh, 0.1875, and the width of the slot is a quarter inch. So got my calculator here. We'll say 0.25 minus 0.1875. So that leaves us with a 16th of an inch as kind of that's the, the, the extra. Really, on the second pass, that's really all we're taking off. So whichever one we do first, the second one's getting that much taken off. So this is what we got to account for. But what we need to also think about is if we leave a side allowance, especially on a slot, it's 30 thousandths or it's 15 thousandths on this side and it's 15 thousandths on this side. So it's 30 thousandths 
taken off that. So if we pull our calculator up, we would then say, whoops, I would then go in and say minus 30 thousandths. And so we just have this 32 thou, and that's really what we're going to fit. But really, it's if you do your math and you don't have a positive value afterwards, if you don't, if, if it's either zero or uh, it's it's real close, that's the reason sometimes you don't get tool paths in these small areas because it's got to take into account uh, the size of the tool, you know, and and how much materials um, being left. So just be careful, you know, just be aware of that. See what you think. Um, but yeah, 15,000 should be good. We should get some passes and then the finish tool is just going to come in and clean those up. So I picked the contour ramp. We got two options with the contour ramp. We're only going an eighth inch deep. So I could say do a depth per pass. And what this means is wherever we start, when we do our depth, we're going to make our cut around. And by the time we get back to where we started, we're going to be however much deeper. So if I wanted to do this in kind of two passes i could say go a 16th of an inch per pass and it's going to do you know kind of two full passes on its way down we could also just set it up with an angle and say run using this angle uh and your machine your your uh your your tool manufacturer might have ideas or a, a, a better guess on specific tooling on what you might use for a ramp angle uh that's what you're going to look for the ramp angle for your tool Three degrees is pretty common, but I've seen some some uh, tooling guys that recommend going seven, a little bit higher, so it's a little bit more aggressive. Uh, I'm going to do it with an angle. I don't use angle too often. I'm going to do it with an angle, see what we get. Uh, that way it can kind of take its time. You know, It's got the full circle to go around to get down to an eighth of an inch. Uh, so hopefully that's good. So we'll say next. Right here's our leads. So we have our, our plunge and our ramp. And then we have our lead in and lead out, which technically the roughing toolpath doesn't need compensation. So I kind of could use just a vertical lead. Um, so I'm not actually going to get comp on this one. Let's we're, we're going to play with this. So I'm going to go next. All right here's our corner types. So I have my uh, the sharp corners, whatever I got. I'm just going to say next again. Sequencing optimized. Uh, I'll apply that to all operations so it copies it down to this sequencing page as well. And then we have our advanced feed. So I'm just going to ignore that. For the finish pass, I'm going to use the same 316 tool right there. Uh, go next. Finish pass should be a bit better. We should have some space to do this lead. It's not much, um, but we got we just got to be really careful that we don't accidentally plunge into the other wall that's kind of the big thing here so if i go and pull my calculator back up i believe if i do a lead of the 16th divided by two so i'll go with a 30 second i'm going to go with a right angle lead and i'm going to set it to 0 0.03125 all right so that should be a, a 30 second i think it's going to be short enough really again all we're doing here is getting this thing to plunge down and not come into the wall we need this lead though to do to output that G41 in the code. If we don't put a lead out, a lead on it, then we we lose that G41. So we'll see the results. We might have to adjust this a little bit. Um, nothing too concerning though. So there's our corner types, sequencing, feed rates. All right. When we're done, we hit compute. And there it is. So let me go ahead and blank all this out real quick. And I just want to look at the finish pass specifically, because it looks to me like it's plunging right in the middle, feeding over, making a cut. So hopefully we're not colliding. And if you're ever concerned with it, all right, what you could do is you could right click on where it says profile finish and back plot. There's our tool. And so I'll turn the speed. Well, I'm just going to step through it, really. So let me rotate that. And so we see the edge. So we'll see it's going to drop straight down into the slot, feed over to the wall, and then it's going to make its cut all the way around and then do the opposite. That's perfect. So a little bit of basic math, knowing what size slot you have or hole or whatever, and then knowing what size tool you're using, just some basic math on the calculator, and we can figure out some, some perfect leads for it. Or you can just eyeball it technically you know I, I could set up a, a, a lead in of 15 thousandths 
and that would be fine. I could get it to to be closer. Um, really, this is the the furthest it's allowed to be before we cut into that wall. So as long as that leads any bit off of that line, we're good. All right. So let's go ahead and rename this. We'll just call it slot. Yeah, that'll work. And I'll shrink it up. All right. So, all right, let's jump into uh, the T slots there. So the T slots, they're really easy to do. They, the, a lot of people overthink them. The biggest thing though, is when you're cutting T slots, and it's something I've run into a bunch, but a lot of times people run into uh, having to do multiple depths. The first thing I would say is try and get a tool that matches the groove. You know, these could be O-ring grooves, snap ring grooves, whatever they are. A lot of like, uh, who is it? There's, um, it's not key cut. Uh, there's a, it's key something. They, they make a lot of uh, a key cutter. It might not just key cutter, uh, but they make T cutters. Uh, they, they make these, they, they call it, it's key something. They have hundreds of different thickness uh, T cutters for all different applications. So you can give them a call or get, look at their book and try and find one that's the closest you can get to. I got a customer that custom custom orders these 46,000 thick um, T cutters just to do O-ring snap grooves. Uh, so he's got these 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 O-rings that he puts or snap ring grooves for on shafts and stuff. So this one's a pretty common size. It's an eighth inch. There's nothing too crazy about it. The big thing with your T cutters that people always, you know, the big struggle is figuring out the overhang for everything. Um, so you want to make sure the shaft is small enough, but big enough that you got some rigidity and that the, the blade itself or the saw itself, uh, the T cutter is, uh, <clears throat> you know, large enough to go in and make the cuts. So I'm just going to right click on my milling tools and go to my tool crib. And, uh, over on the left here, I'm going to go down to T cutter and I'll go ahead and add a tool from the library. Now we have a bunch in here. Uh, so you'll see the diameter and then if there's a corner radius the shaft diameter, and then the flute length, all right? That's the important one. So like right here, I have a half inch diameter with a eighth inch thick uh, T cutter. So if I open this up, if I just double click it, I have, uh, again, diameter of a half inch. The flute length is the thickness of that, uh, the saw. And then the shaft diameter is a quarter of an inch. So we take our half inch diameter, we subtract the um, shaft diameter. That gives us a quarter inch of, of cutting ability, but we have to remember it's a round part. We got to divide that by two. So as long as my groove, which I'm not a hundred percent sure, I don't think it's, I don't think I did an eighth inch, but as long as my groove depth wise, and it might actually just be an eighth inch, we'll see. Uh, I have an eighth inch of depth that I could cut into a wall. Uh, before I run into the shaft. So I might have to come in and pick maybe a, uh, you know, a three quarter inch. Let's go. Let's do that. We'll go with a three quarter inch, um, which gives me a shaft diameter of three eighths. So if we subtract the two, we got three eighths left of cutting. We divide that by two. We got three sixteenths point one eight seven five. I don't think I went that deep with the groove. So I'm going to use that one. I think that'll work just fine. And again, I'm trying to pick a tool that matches the thickness. There is ways to use like a, a you know, a 16th inch T cutter and have it do multiple steps. But a lot of that ends up relying on a, a lot of times it's extra tool paths. You have to put more than one tool path in. Um, again, there's ways to do it. You just got to, uh, if anyone's interested, I'll go, I could go a bit deeper into T cutters um, at some point. So I'm going to pick this half or half inch, this, this three quarter inch, uh, eighth inch T cutter here. Just hit OK. And there it is. So again, that's got the, uh, what is it? Three sixteenths. So three sixteenths of overhang on there. So I, I'm pretty sure it should be good. So we'll hit OK. And then we're just going to use a profile. It's really not that bad of a tool path. It's a pretty straightforward one. I'm going to right click on machine setup, go down to mill two axis, and I'm going to select my geometry. Now, the geometry we want to pick, we always go to the finish size, the finish face or the finish edge. So I'm going to do each one of these slots individually. We can't do them both at the same time. So I'm just going to pick this inside edge. Now, that is kind of the back corner of that groove there, but I'm going to pick that and you'll see the preview of it, you know, showing it right there. 
and uh, I'll set my depth. So pick bottom. I'm just going to pick the bottom edge of this top groove here. And then I'll hit OK. Now, one thing I didn't do is I didn't uh, measure the, the the hole that I'm picking, the, the, the wall that I'm picking. I didn't measure that, so I don't know what the diameter is. Uh, but right here, we'll go to our machining strategy, just a, a profile rough and a profile finish, nothing crazy. We got our tabs, no changes, posting, no changes. And then right here, we'll go up to the tool crib. Over on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, you have all the supported tools for this feature. So we're going to go to T cutter. I'll choose my three quarter inch uh, T cutter. There it is. Right here, we have our pattern. So I'll go left with a comp left, uh, a standard tool path, nothing crazy here. We have our parameters. I'll leave 15 thousandths for another finish pass to get cleaned up. We're going single step because the thickness of the blade is the thickness of what we want to cut. Right here is our leads, so I'm going to go with a right angle lead. Now, off the top of my head, I think the, the total diameter of that, I think I did an eighth inch deep groove. So it should be 2.25. That's what I'm going to try and set up. So I'm going to say 2.25 minus 0.75, and that's a 1.5. But I'm also going to subtract 30 thousandths for the allowance that's there. So I'll say minus 30 thou. And then whatever's left, I'm going to divide that by two. All right. So when you think of your allowance, that's that's the amount of material that you're leaving on the part. I may have had to add it or some, we'll find out in a second. So it should be a length of 0.735. And that should drop this. The, the, the whole reason I'm doing this is so that the T cutter can go right down the middle of the hole, feed over to the wall and then make its cut. So we'll try that. Right here, we have our corner types, ignore it, machine sequencing, optimized, apply to all operations. And we have our advanced feed rates. And then finally, the profile finish. So again, I'll go to my tool crib, T cutter, pick it, OK it, next. Compensation to the left, next. Now that we don't, since we don't have any compensation on this one, or not compensation, since we don't have any allowance on this one now, when we do our right angle lead, we could do just the, the same thing. So I'll say 2.25 minus uh, 0.75. And then whatever the result is, divide it by two. And then next, corner types, no changes there. Machine sequence, I already did the apply to all operations and advanced feeds. So I'm going to hit compute. And overall, it looks pretty decent, actually. That, that actually looks... Perfect. So let me just measure that corner real quick. I'm just going to go to evaluate, measure one, and just pick that inside wall. Yeah, 2.25. Cool. So that's it. We have it set there. So that's going to be a T cutter that goes in, and I'll back plot that bad boy. So back plot. So T cutter is going to come in, feed down the middle, feed over to the wall. Uh, you did, didn't even spiral around because it's only one pass, like it goes straight through, and then it's done. So that's going to be, we'll rename this top T cut. And then I'm just going to copy it. And I'm going to right click on machine setup one and say paste feature. Uh, yeah, I'll use the same top and depth for now. I'm going to rename it first so that we have it labeled properly. Bottom T cut. And uh, then I can shrink out the top one, kind of close it up, blank that guy out. And then for the bottom T cut, I'll reselect the geometry. I'm going to pick that inside edge once again. The only difference is I'm going to say pick bottom. I'm going to pick the bottom edge right there. Hit OK. Compute that tool path and blank it out. All right, so there we go. So a little bit more stuff we're going to do. Uh, we're going to watch the simulation here in a second, then probably break for lunch. Um, what I got, what I'm going to figure out here during lunch is a, a good way to go about cleaning up the uh, outside here, because um, you got to think we we have a square piece of stock. So technically, I could go in and I could cut my way around here. It really depends on how much of this stock we're holding on to. You know, maybe we're only holding on to a quarter inch of it, in which case, or a half inch of it, in which case I could go down, you know, a quarter inch deep around the outside cut that in all the way around and then I could throw my my uh my corner round on there so that way we don't have to do a third op when we do that and that's probably how we'll do it uh we'll do that after lunch so let me do a save as here 
And this is something I, I, I should have been doing this the whole time, uh, saving this. I mean, it would have sucked if we lost all this, but I'm just going to go in and put this uh, tool path. All right. And then say save. All right. There we go. Give it a second. All right. There we go. Saved. Good. Good. So let's check it out inside the simulation. So I'll stay start simulation. And like I said, guys, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw those into the uh, questions box so that we can uh, we can talk. It's kind of my only way of really communicating with you guys right now. All right, so here we go. This is the part. So I mentioned it earlier. Uh, when I go through my stock uh, setup, I get to the final work offset. So what I did was I lifted my part up two inches here. And that's, again, because I want my part, it's actually floating. It's got a quarter inch underneath it because it's 1.75 tall. If I don't put in that that number, my part ends up sitting inside the table. And so if you can see the machine, it's something you'll have to change. If you can't see the machine when it's on the machine setting, it's nothing you got to worry about. Most of the time I run it with the workpiece stock option anyway. And so here we go. We're going to start by facing it off. And remember, this is facing and it's creating that zero. Let me restart this and slow it down. There we go. All right. So we're going to face off the top. Remember, when you do something like this, you would be defining the Z point in which you want to face off. So you could take a measurement in your stock and say, okay, I need to take off a 16th. You're going to touch off the rough stock. You're going to jog down a 16th. You're going to reset Z0 and you're going to run your face pass. And that's creating that plane for you. We got our one inch drill. Then we got that five ace tool going in and doing a spiral to clean up the pocket. May not, may not be doing an actual spiral, actually. It looks like it's linking. Chamfer on the top, and then we start on the outside. And any one of these passes, if it looks too aggressive depth wise, it could be. And you might not ever run a job this aggressively like I am here. Um, but Remember, all the only change that you'd make between the way I'm doing it, where we're doing these full passes like so, and maybe doing multiple passes, is just switching the option to multiple passes to allow it to do uh, a couple passes. So it's kind of opened up some space now, doing a full path across the whole part. And uh, yeah, I'll speed it up a little bit here. There's that open pocket. Looks good. Now it's got a, a path around the whole part so you can get it to really work its way in there. And then it should just do a finish pass on this afterwards. So it's almost done. And then I gotta slow it down because the last operations are pretty short ones. So we wanna make sure we don't miss them. So I'll slow that down. There we go, here's our finish pass. And I'm concerned about these corners. I was worried there was gonna be too much meat left in there for that tool to clean up, but I don't see anything standing up. So that's good news. There's our little chamfer around the top, just like that. Then we're going to go switch. Here's the slot. So this is the one where your tool's probably not going to be uh, very happy with you. You can see the ramp in on that, and then it goes around, kind of cuts where it needs to. Here's the second pass around, opening up the slot a little bit more to the full quarter inch wide. Then we're going to come in with our finish tool. And kind of clean this whole area up right there. Same thing around the outside. So we can clean that slot up. There we go. Now we're going to go with that T-cutter. We're going to cut groove number one. And then we're going to finish groove number one. No rubbing of the shank on there. That's good news. Got the next one running. And finish pass. And there it is. That's our part. So if we want to compare that to the, the part that we've already created, the, the solid model that we have, under visibility over here, because I left the solid model on in my CAD window, so since the layer is on, I have the ability to load in the workpiece. So when I load in this workpiece, we could see everything we got. We can see the profiles look good. And what I'm looking for when I'm comparing my solid model to what I'm cutting here inside of the uh, simulation 
is these surfaces that we see like this, where it's blue and white. The blue and white shows me that really what's happening is, is the simulation doesn't know whether to show us the blue, which is the area we cut, or the white because it's the part. There's all the surfaces are sitting in the exact same area. So it's not really sure how to show it. You can actually go in and uh, over here under the analysis tab at the bottom, you can turn on a deviation option. And I think someone asked about this. One of the last times I did this, uh, someone asked me about this. Let me move this up a little bit. So this deviation allows us to, to kind of get a minimum and a maximum, a plus and a minus, kind of like our, uh, you know, like, like tolerances, your plus and minus, whatever. So in this case, it's uh, plus or minus six point oh six four, and the colors that it uses. So if we're, if we're 64 thousandths out, it's going to show up as this dark blue. As we get closer and closer to zero, our preferred number to be at is going to be green. We want it to be green, but really 19 is too many colors. So what I'm going to do is say, let's do, uh, let's do seven colors. And so let me just drop this down. There it is, uh, there it is right there. So what we want to be between now is uh, it's still green. So we want it to be green. If we show up as green, it means we're within uh, negative eight thou and positive eight thou. And again, if you go with bit with more numbers, you'll vary that. So you can play around with different values. So all you have to do is turn this on and then hit refresh right here and then just wait. It'll take a second and it takes a bit longer on more complex parts. Uh, but now what I'll do is I'll hide my solid. And uh, pretty much everything there that we see is green is a good surface. It's between eight, you know, negative eight and eight thou. And we could make that a much uh, smaller value if we were really concerned with it. So another cool option in the simulation. But that's it. So let's go ahead and break for now. Uh, we'll come back at one o'clock. Uh, unless you guys have questions, I'm going to be sitting here for the next 10 minutes till I leave for lunch anyway. Uh, but if you guys have questions, feel free to throw them in. You can throw them in during lunch and I'll try and uh, answer them as soon as we get back. And uh, when we get back, what we'll do is we will uh, we'll do the outside profile a little bit, just enough so we can get this this um, corner rounding bit in here, and then we'll flip the part over and do the bottom stuff. And and this stuff's real simple; shouldn't take us too long at all. Uh, but we're going to do it all in one window, so that when we watch our simulation, we get to see the full everything run. All right. So let's go ahead and break for now. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, if you guys have any questions, throw them into the into the questions box here during lunch. And uh, I'll try and answer before we get started on the next one. So thanks, guys. Talk to you in a bit. I just want to run through. We just got back from lunch. We'll go ahead and run through this simulation uh, one more time. Like I said, before you run the simulation, one of the best things to do uh, just for your own sanity and just for yourself, it's something I started doing uh, a lot more. Before I run the simulation, I hit save. At this point, all my tool paths are computed. Uh, none of these took too outrageously long to save, but for those of you guys that are going to get into three axis, three axis tool paths take longer to save. So you want to give, you know, you want to save them as often as you can. But for me, it's primarily before I run the simulation. Because if you watch, and I'll try and pull it up, let me see, there it is. Uh, if you watch on the performance part of your task manager, uh, this is my computer, you know, doing all of its stuff. Uh, not a crazy, crazy utilization. Let me see. Always on top. So this is going to stay on top now. And so I got my CPU reading. So you can see it's kind of it's kind of doing some work. I got some uh, programs running. I'm also recording this whole thing. So it's a, it's a little bit of work. But what you'll see is when you start the simulation, um, you'll get almost a, a big bump of, of uh, usage, utilization on your computer sometimes. This one's ac actually handling it pretty well. Uh, you can see some of my cores of my processor are spiking a little bit, working a little harder. Uh, but overall, it's handling it pretty well. And depending on your processor, you may not have uh, kind of enough to give. And I've seen a lot of computers that when they go to launch the simulation, everything slows down. Um, you know, you don't want to do too many things at the same time, but everything seems to slow down when the simulation starts to launch. So you can see kind of the spikes that we hit when we started launching it. You see littler ones here, a big one right there. Uh, but overall, it's calmed back down. We're back down to a proper, you know, low level utilization here. So looking pretty good.
All right, so just be aware that the simulations, are, it's just a hit to your computer when it first starts launching. It's got, it's a, it's a heavy, uh, a heavy thing for the computer to, to start up. So uh, move this back over here, close it down. All right, so again, we got it doing a face pass across this whole thing. Just facing it off. And then we come in, it's gonna be quick center drill and drill. We open up the pocket, turn that guy to none. Finish it, chamfer it. We start on the outside doing all the uh, the roughing for the kind of plus sign shape we got there. Switch tools, finish with a, uh, I think that was an eighth inch, right? Yeah, eighth inch, no quarter inch, quarter inch. Yeah, because they're eighth inch radiuses. There it is. Chamfer on the top there, looks good. And then going and doing that that o-ring groove that slot that we got in there whatever we want to call that thing coming back clean it up remember that one's doing a ramp so you see that little little ramp entry i only got it at three degrees so we could go even smaller if we went with something like a one degree uh, or we could go more aggressive and get down to the bottom even faster so let that finish running around there t cutters on the inside we got a rough and a finish and they're done all right, so I was thinking about this during lunch, how we could get away with uh, doing this. And for me, I guess it really depends on how we're holding this part. You know, when we go and show our stock, where is it? When we show our stock, you know, here's my stock. If I'm holding on to this ledge right here is one inch tall, all right? So I'm gonna say that I'm holding on to this bottom half inch. I've already taken off all this material. So I just wanna go from here down about a half inch, or we'll say like three eighths of an inch, we'll try and do. And I'm gonna use my five eighths tool because that'll hopefully open up a nice channel that we could then come in and do our corner round on so we don't have to flip flop back and forth with uh, operations. So I'm just gonna go over here, right click on machine setup one, and I'm gonna do a mill two axis. When I go to select my geometry, the easiest geometry to select is this bottom edge. It doesn't matter for 2D, kind of where the Z level of your geometry is, because you're gonna define the, the start point, the height that it starts at, your, your top of feature, and you're also gonna define the depth, all right? So I'm just gonna hover over this line here, and you'll see it lights up pink. I haven't clicked on it, but if I hover over it and I right click, I get an option called a constant Z or a loop selection. What constant Z is gonna do is it's gonna grab the chain around the entire same Z level. So it's gonna run that chain along the Z level and kind of grab what it can. The loop selection is better for geometry that's not sitting flat in a Z plane like this is, but what you do is you right click on your edge and say loop select. And then what you'll see is a preview of the two possible loops that can be created from that one chain that I picked. So we have a loop that goes all the way around the outside, you know, the bottom of it there, or we have another loop right here and the way that we select which loop we want to keep is if this is this is the line i right clicked on i pick any other line or any other pink line that's showing up this this preview line i pick any other line that goes to the chain that i want to keep so in my case i'll just pick this edge right here and it'll grab the full chain it now knows which one we want to keep all right so big thing with this one is we've already machined uh the stock down to um, this level here. So I wanna start my top of job from right there. And I'm gonna tell it to just go three eighths of an inch deep. All right. Now I'm also just gonna turn on my layer here that has my solid on it. Uh, just because if we kind of look at this, I think using this, this edge right here, this corner is a perfect spot to set up our start point because I could do a parallel lead in and a parallel lead out. And that's a pretty uh, thin piece of material that we got left right there. So that's what I'll do. I'll say chain. Oh, look, it already picked it for me. So the only thing I gotta do, I'm gonna use that corner and I'm gonna go ahead and reverse the direction right there, just like that. All right, so there it is. So now we have our top apart, we have our depth, so I'll hit okay. And on this one, all we're gonna do is a uh, profile. So we'll go profiling, which gives me a rough and a finish pass. Uh, on this one, yeah, I'll, I'll do a finish pass just to just to bring it to size. Realistically, I could probably get away with just doing a profile rough, 
and then leaving my allowance at zero if we wanted to do that. But I'm going to do a profile rough, a profile finish, and corner rounding because the geometry selection between the profile doing the outside and that corner rounding is the same exact piece of geometry. So I'll leave it there. I'll go next. Right here's our tabs, no changes on that. So we'll go next again. Right here's our posting tab. Again, work offset one, that's always what we're gonna leave it at. We have our contour ramping stuff. Uh, right here, I'm gonna use that 5 ace tool, should be plenty big to give us a nice channel through all of this and not uh, constrict our tool at all. Uh, this is our rough pass. If you wanna use compensation on your rough, you can. Uh, I don't think it's gonna hurt anything, but you don't really need it until your finish pass. Uh, 15 thou, I'll do, I'll do the three eighths in, uh, I'll do multiple steps on this one just because I haven't yet. And then I'll go next, just two passes. Now for this one, a good lead for this, and, and I picked it on that corner specifically because a parallel lead, I could get it to start off the part. I can get it to cut its way around. And then when it's done, I can get it to lead a bit past the, uh, the entrance. So I'll do a parallel lead. I got a five eighths tool. So I'm going to make it five eighths of an inch. Uh, we'll see the simulation. Sometimes you got to go a little bit bigger depending on the angles you're working at to, to get the tool far enough away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I'll hit next. All right, there's my corner types. I'm just going to ignore that. Sequencing, going to tell it optimized and apply that to all the operations that have a same page. Then we have our advanced feeds, which converts our rapids, leads, you know, feed rate percentages, and that corner slowdown. And then our profile finish. Once again, just going to use the same 5 ace flat for this guy. I could use something smaller, but this will work fine. Got my G41 turned on. Parameters, we're going full depth, just taking off that 15 thousandths. Uh, leads, again, going to go parallel. And 5 ace. If I had thought about it earlier, uh, what I could have done is on this earlier leads page, I could have said apply to all operations and that'll copy it down to all of these features. So not a bad way of doing it if you're doing the same leads every time. Corner types, you can ignore that. Machine sequence already set up for optimize when I did the apply to all and then the advanced feeds. Now corner rounding and chamfer milling. We already saw chamfer mill earlier. Um, essentially, they're just finish passes. It's literally a profile finish with a different tool. So the compensation has to be handled a little bit differently, but this should work just fine. I'll go next. Uh, we got our corner round tool. It's our half inch with an eighth inch radius here. Uh, and you'll see the small diameter length. So this right here for my tool is non-existent. I don't have a small diameter. Um, I don't run into too many that have this small diameter, but you could, I mean, it's, it's like a roller bearing guided, um, corner rounding tool essentially uh you could have that there's there's a bunch of different designs the big thing with this is you're gonna have if you or sorry if you have that small diameter this bottom section right here that will affect the depth that you have to set everything up at we're going an eighth inch deep it's it's an eighth inch radius the tool's made for an eighth inch so an eighth inch radius should uh work for us with no problems we'll find out uh, when we simulate it but by going in if you have a tool that has that small diameter right on the tip there you may have to mess with your depth a little bit because everything's based off the tip of the tool and technically the tips way down there but if you know the distance you should be able to factor it in all uh, right here's our patterns again it's i guess it's more like a, a, a profile rough because it has side roughing so you have your standard cut you also have side roughing so you can actually use this if you're doing a larger uh, radius on a corner, you can use this side roughing to start outside that radius and then step your way in to your final fillet size. Again, you can use a compensation as well. Uh, so I'm going to go next. Parameters, you just got your your side allowance, your uh, your your single step, multiple steps. If you want to step your way in, you could. Uh, total depth, eighth inch. That's exactly what I set it up for. Next, I got my leads, parallel. That should be fine. It's a little longer than I need, but should be good. Corner types, no changes. Sequencing, it's already set to optimized and advanced feeds. So when we're all done with this, we should be able to just hit compute. And then I'm gonna blank it all out like so and rename it real quick. Uh, so we'll do rename, let's say outside 
profile uh, for, I'm going to put CR for corner round. All right, so there's our, our outside profile. And we could look, if we look at our stock here, all right, I'll unblank the stock for a second. We can actually see it. We're outside the stock by a good bit there. Shouldn't have anything to plunge into. That's good news. Uh, then right here, we have our profile finish. And then right here, we have our corner round, which is right up there on that top edge. So I'll just blank that stock back out. And that's it. That's the top side of the part. So we're going to run the simulation. We'll check it out one last time. And uh, and then we'll move on to the op two on the bottom side. So I'll say save. Again, always save before simulating. No reason not to. And then simulation. I'll launch it. <laughs> made it all right so we've seen all this i'm just going to fast forward down to right here on the op list the move list over there so that's everything that's been run so far i'll slow it down a skosh here and then we'll go ahead and say run and that's just going to plunge off the part get into the material remember i did two passes on this i've been way more aggressive with everything else so far so i probably don't uh don't need to go too crazy with this. Uh, but that tool's going to hate you the entire time it's doing all of this. So uh, best to take it in multiple passes, slow it down, whatever you can do to kind of alleviate the uh, the tool. Here it is, just cleaning up the extra 15 thousandths uh, around here. And then with our half inch uh, corner rounding tool, it's just going to come in and add that radius. Right around the corner on there. There we go. And done. So there's the top side of the part. Call it. So now we'll close this down. All right. So for op two, so the whole, not really, yeah, op two, we'll say is uh, we're going to do the bottom side. So we already have some of the geometry we can use for this. So like cleaning up the outside cuts and bringing in that hexagon, we already have that open pocket layer there. So that'll work. Um, that'll tell it kind of where the stock is, where we need to cut to. Um, yeah, let's do it. So I'm just going to start by right clicking on you. There's two places to do this. You could do this by right clicking on machine setup one, and then you go down to additional functions and then, whoops, and then insert setup. Or you could just right click on milling job here and it's right down here, add setup. So when I do that, I get a machine setup number two. So machine setup one was here. All right, let me unblank my stock just so we can see it. So machine setup one's the back left corner. So the first thing I need to kind of plan out in my head is when I'm standing at the machine, how am I going to flip this part over? Am I going to go end over end like so? or end over end like so. And that's important. Uh, I, I don't think you'll have too many issues with this part because it's uh, fairly symmetrical when you flip it over. So it shouldn't be too big of a deal, but especially on parts when, when it's not all symmetrical, you need to know how you're gonna flip it at the machine. So what I could do is I could flip it and I'll say, I'm gonna flip it uh, along or around the X. I'm gonna go over the X. So this is the flip I'm gonna make. All right. Now you could rotate your part, but that that can also mess other things up. The whole goal of what we're doing right now is seeing what the fully final finished part's going to come out looking like. So by doing all all the setups in one window, when I run my simulation, I'm going to see the top operation run and then I'm going to see the part flip over and I'm going to do the bottom operation. So I need to know that I flip it the right way at the machine. Because right here for machine setup two, I need to right click and say edit. And this is going to open up all those points on my part again. So I can go to origin and I'm going to pick this back left corner once again. Or in this case, I guess technically now I got a hole in the center of the stock. So I could use the middle of the stock if I wanted to, which would be a lot more consistent. The problem is when we, when we do it this way without rotating our part, the origin is stuck in the way that the origin's originally made. So it's, it's matching the world coordinate system, the, the total UCS. 
And so we have our Z going the wrong way right now. Whenever we're cutting into our parts, we want Z pointing up perpendicular to whatever it is we're trying to machine. So that's what these buttons right here are for, your X, Y, and your Z direction. Now, normally these buttons, this uh, setup orientation would be used to, to kind of morph it to match a part that may not be you know, square or whatever. Uh, in our case, though, we don't have to pick new directions. All the directions are, are there, like X is in the correct spot, Y and Z are in the correct spot, they're just flipped the wrong way. So we need to just flip them. And that's what these little buttons here are gonna be used for. And the main thing I tell people when they're doing this is don't pay attention to the Z, just pay attention to X and Y. And by just flipping those two, Z will end up falling into the correct place. We follow the right hand rule. Uh, so there's no way to get a left hand rule to pop out. If you don't know what the right hand rule is, uh, it's essentially that X, Y, and Z, if you, if you take your, your thumb and your pointer finger and you make an L on your right hand, uh, and then you take your middle finger and you point it directly at yourself, so it's standing perpendicular to, to your palm, that's your right hand rule. You can Google it, there's pictures, it'll talk all about it. We have no way of doing, if you, if you do the same thing with your left hand, we have no way of setting up a left hand rule. So everything we do is a right-hand rule. So everything eventually kind of falls into place as you do this. If it confuses you when you're setting this up, these three buttons will eventually get you to the right spot. But like I said, the main focus when you're doing them, don't flip Z. You rarely have to flip Z. It's usually just flipping X and Y, and then Z kind of falls into place. So if I flip my X, you'll see it messes with my Y. So now my Y is in the right spot, but my X is in the wrong spot. So I could undo that, go back to how I was, and then I'll just flip my Y. And so now the X is in the right spot, the Y flipped to the correct spot, and when it flipped to the right spot, the Z came with it. So now I got that Z perpendicular to my part, and I should plan on seeing my tool plunge in with a negative Z value to go in and start cutting that part, all right? The only other change I'm gonna make is right here for my Z, I'll set that at two inches and hit okay. And one of the biggest reasons I do parts this way, I have customers that I work with that they, they don't like programming parts like this because it makes the file so big and they, they have to remember to do stuff when they're doing, you know, when they're bringing out separate pieces of code. The big benefit that I find by doing this is I can copy and paste tool paths. A lot of times when we're flipping parts over, we're using a lot of the same tool paths we were using before. So we could actually use this to uh, to flip the part over and then like the facing feature. Uh, I could come in here, I can copy this facing feature. I could go ahead and paste it right down here. It's gonna prepare, it's gonna do its thing. And all I have to do is compute that tool path. Now I have a facing pass on there. So again, with the face, the way that I set it up, my face is creating my zero plane, all right? So if my parts, in this case, it's 1.75, all right? So on the first top side, I go in and I face off, you know, say my, say my stock that I start with is two inches. So I go in, I touch off my raw stock, I move over next to the part, you know, I zero off, I zero my Z on that rough stock, I move off the part, I'm gonna jog down, say a hundred thousandths. So I'm now at a 1.9 inch tall block after it's been faced off. Well, when I flip the part over, you know, I flip it over and then I do my next face. Again, I'd touch off that raw stock. Well, really, I'd, I'd take a measurement of my part. Know the thickness on your second op because you might not be at exactly, you know, 1.9 or whatever. But now I could go in, I take a measurement of my part. I know that the part has to end up at 1.75. So I take my, my measured thickness and I subtract 1.75, touch off the top of the part, and then jog Z down. In our case, it should be about 150 thousandths if everything was perfect, but you would just go down to get you down to 1.75. And then again, when you run that face, when you deck it off, you're creating your zero plane. You might have a completely different way to do your facing. And I, I sincerely apologize if this is confusing you, uh, cause I have had guys that get confused when I start trying to talk about this. Um, so if you're confused, let me know. We'll talk about it, uh, in some other, we could talk about it some other time. Um, but essentially that's what I'm doing here. I got my face. 
and and that face is creating zero. So I now got the top of op two done. So let me blank that out, and there it is. Let me blank out the tool path now, right there. Shrink it up. So really, on this side, we uh, we don't got much to do. We got to do a pocket, and uh, we got to do some profile stuff on the outside, and some uh, some tapped holes. I'm going to do some quarter twenties in there. So simple enough. I think I'll start with. Uh, Oh, let's think the vice is holding on to here. Uh, I'm going to do the outside profile first because it's not really a profile. It's just like we did the top side earlier where we did this open pocket. All right. Great, Paul. I'm glad you like it. Like I said, the, the facing thing can be a really confusing thing. <laughs> and I've had a lot of guys that just are like, oh, you know what? I'm never going to use Bobcat to face. I'll just do it all manually. And then and then I'll put my my squared up stock in there. So. Yeah, play around with it. It works out pretty good. It is limited to how well you can measure the, the thickness of your part, though. So, uh, if you're if you got some Harbor Freight calipers, they may not do well, but ah, you'll be close enough. Tolerances, right? All right. So I'm going to use the same method we did on the top side here. The only difference is the geometry selection is going to be a skosh different. So I'm going to right click on the stock open pocket here, say copy, and then I'm going to right click on machine setup two down here and paste my feature. Uh, it says, do you wanna use the same top and depth? Yeah, I'll say, sure. And then geometry, and uh, I do have a chamfer mill on here, which you'll notice we don't have a chamfer on the part. It's up to you if you wanna break corners, you could you could cut the corner on that, you could uh, do the chamfer. Otherwise, the way to get rid of a tool path is just open the feature up, so edit the feature, go to the machining strategy tab, and then remove it, all right? And I'll just say finish. So with this one, the geometry is going to use this hexagon here. And it's going to use that rectangle down there. It doesn't matter that they're on different Z levels. They just need to be seen together. So I'll right click on geometry and say reselect. And I'm going to go ahead and pick the outside square there first. And you can see it grabbed that rectangle. It actually moved it up to the top of the part. And then I'm going to hover over this edge and right click. Say constant Z. It'll grab the whole thing. So we have chain one, chain two, all right? Uh, from there, uh, we just have to set up our depth, which three quarters of an inch should be good because I'm going down a bit past this. If we want to go deeper, we could. I'm going to go with three quarters and just uh, make sure my start points are in the right way. So I'll go right here to the profile chains. We'll see, okay, to the left of this one puts us on the outside. That's good. I'm going to move that to the, to the center of that though so we can do our same parallel leads on there. And then this really is irrelevant. It's it's a pocket, so it'll figure it out. So I'll hit OK. And then I'm just going to compute that tool path. And uh, apparently I didn't. Oh, I know what I did. I got to give it a little offset. So the problem I'm running into with this open pocket is this right here, that edge. So that edge being so perfectly matched to this. Uh, is going to cause us problems. It's going to give us some some bad results. So we can't use that geometry. It ends up. Uh, so what I'll do real quick is I'm just going to offset it. So I'm just going to uh, take this stock open pocket here. I'm going to go to create 2D. I'm going to do a offset, and I'm going to go half the diameter of my tool. So 0 0.625 divided by two. One offset. All I got to do is hold shift and pick this shape. Let it offset out. I could tell it that I want to use sharp corner, corners or not. I'll just leave it right there. Uh, when we offset, it does not remember the um, the line style. So I do have to come back in and repick that geometry for the line style. So I'll go do a uh, modify line style dotted. Okay. Another way to kind of handle this whole situation. And uh, yeah, I got to change the leads for that. Another way to handle this situation um, would be to break these kind of individually, do this, because really the stock ends right here and right here, it's pretty close. So kind of just doing this triangle, you know, right here, cutting that away, and then doing that section there, that would get you some results that are better than what we got a second ago. But now if I go in, I will, uh, Remove my old geometry, I'll reselect. So I'll pick the top edge here. And then I'm just gonna hold shift and pick this outer uh, rectangle now. So basically I'm giving it room around the part to do that open pocket. 
Uh, again, I'll check my start point here, put it right there, flip the direction of it so it's going the correct way, hit OK, and then I'll just compute that again and see if it comes out right. That looks much better, much better. All right, perfect. So let me uh, get out of here so you guys can see it uh, right there. So there's the toolpath. It's going around, just, just removing all that excess stock we have on the outside. And then real quick, I'll fix my leads uh, in here. So I'll just say edit. I'm going to go down to my leads for my finish. Parallel. Uh, I got a 5 ace, so I'll go 5 ace just for fun. And there it is right there. So that works out pretty decent. All right. So there it is. That's what we got. Caught on the outside, cleaning all that stuff up. Now, you have... Uh, what was I going to say? The uh, So that's going to cut. No, it looks good. Now, there's other ways of doing this that could be a little bit better. We could even convert this to like a high-speed machining strategy if we uh, if we wanted to. Oh, spring passes. I want to just talk about spring passes real fast. I get, I get questions about this all the time. How do you add spring passes in Bobcat? There is no specific little button that says do spring passes. Um, it'd be really awesome if they did that. But there's nothing in there that does it. So let's say when I go and machine this, and really it'd be something like maybe that inside bore there that we have. Um, when we go to, you know, size everything up, we might want some spring passes. And if you don't know what spring passes are, they're essentially extra passes to, to help clean up the part. Because on your initial rough and finish, your tool's going to deflect. You know, you keep cutting. It slowly brings that deflection down until eventually you have a, a nice straight wall. But your tool will deflect, especially something like this where I'm going, you know, two inches deep. It's the reason I wanted to use a five ace was because I got got some meat to that thing. It doesn't deflect as much, but it will still deflect. So spring passes are super simple. What I tell people do to do is just go through your tool paths like normal on any of your um, areas where you want to do spring passes. You just go to your profile finish right there, copy it, and then paste it under the same feature. So make sure you go to the top top level of the feature and then say paste. Now I have two finish passes or three finish passes. However many little spring passes you want to add in, you just copy and paste and then compute them. And so you'll rerun that finish pass multiple times now. So you're going to do, yeah, just a few extra passes. Um, yeah, super, super handy, super helpful way of uh, of getting it. So there you go. That's a little quick thing about spring passes. So, all right, shrink this up. So now I want to go do this, uh, this pocket here. Um, thinking about it, what do we got? We have our, what am I using for a finish tool on here? Because this, I'm using a quarter inch tool, aren't I? Yes. So let me get rid of these extra passes I got here. I don't need those. All right, so this can use my uh, five ace tool. Ah, let's think about this for a second. I need a five ace. I'll rough it out with the five ace. Maybe clean it up with the. Th okay, so before I go and change this tool to the to the quarter inch tool, or to the um, to the five ace tool, I'm going to use this open pocketing tool path that I have out here on the inside. Remember, it's not that it's an open pocketing path specifically. It's an advanced pocket. So it's allowed to read the geometry. And if the geometry tells it that it's open, then it'll do that. In our case, I got no problem just pocketing across this hole the whole time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this feature and I'm going to paste it. All right, right below it. And then I'm going to rename it. So rename this. We'll go... Um, I'll say star pocket. There we go. All right. And then before I go and work on this star one, I want to get this one all done. So I want to use the same tool to rough and finish this. So I'm going to go down to the finish pass. I'm going to go to the tool crib and pick my five ace flat. Hit OK. Compute. And there it is. Uh, another thing I'll check real fast. I just want to measure the uh, radius of that. Cool. So it is made for a quarter inch. I was just making sure I did everything the way I thought I did. And so now with that copy and pasted tool path, I have the roughing tools that five eighths. And then I have my finishing tool as the uh, the quarter inch. So we'll see if it's too aggressive, kind of how much it leaves, but we'll, we'll judge. We'll, we'll see that in a second. 
So I'm just going to go over here and right click on geometry, say reselect. And then the way I'm going to pick this one is you, you could pull the wireframe off if you want to and put it on a layer. Uh, that will work. Or I'm just going to hover over this edge, right click and say constant Z. And it'll just chain the whole way around. We can go to our chain here and see it's going to try and put the start point of the finish pass there. I would prefer that start point to be somewhere like that. And uh, total depth, or, or let's say top first. So we'll say pick top, we'll pick an edge. So top is still zero. Depth, quarter inch, I'll hit OK. And then I could just go edit this feature. And uh, the only thing I want to look at is on the uh, right parameters page. There it is. Uh, we're going in one step. OK, good. So I'll hit Compute. There it is. You can see our finish pass has some uh, kind of strange leads for what we might be expecting there. Again, that's just a quick change. We'll just edit our feature, go to the leads page of the profile finish there. And then let's say we want to do a little circular one. And uh, we got a quarter inch tool. I'll go with a quarter inch. It really, really, for leads and stuff, as long as it fits inside the area you're trying to clean up, you really don't have to mess with too much. <clears throat> so just try it that way. <clears throat> All right, give me one second, guys. All right, there we go. Seems better. All right, so now I fixed the leads. I'll hit compute. Should be a quick one. There's our leads. I'll deal with that. So that looks good. Pretty straightforward. We may end up uh, being able to use uh, possibly, uh, it depends. We'll watch the simulation, but if there's too much meat right left in there that we can't uh, we can't clean up, we might have to change the um, the tool, or we may end up adding a second pocket and maybe doing a little open pot or uh, open pocketing. We already did that. Doing a uh, the rest roughing on a pocket, but we'll we'll play it by ear. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll see how this comes out first. All right, so hole patterns on the bottom of the part. Uh, we're going to do a center drill, uh, a drill, and a tap. Remember, when you're doing a tap, a lot of the settings are kind of built into the system for you, so you don't really have to worry about it too much. But I'm going to just minimize uh, machine setup one. That way I could shrink these guys up, kind of blank it out and focus on one thing. So when we start this, Come on, get get in the middle. There we go. I'm going to right click on machine setup two, and then I'm going to go down to my uh, my mill tap hole section, and I'll select my geometry. Now the way I'm going to pick the geometry is I just pick either you could pick either the 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 arc right there, or you could pick the wall. Now if you pick the wall, we will try and read the the depth and everything as well, which you may not want to do. Uh, only because with that counter bore in there, it will read the depth incorrectly. So I just like to pick this arc right here. And then I'll hit OK. And so we'll see diameter is a quarter inch. Depth is uh, a half inch. I'll fix all that here in a second. Thread type, quarter 20. That's the default. It didn't figure that out for me or anything. It's just, that's the default. So when I hit next, I get this section right here, which allows me to do my top of part and my depth. On the earlier one, there's no way to get your top apart, uh, which is good. It's actually reading the way I want. By going in and just picking the, the wire frame or just the edge of the hole, um, it reads it as zero. It doesn't, it doesn't shift on the height or anything. So all I got to do is say pick bottom and flip this guy over. I'm just going to pick this, I'll say this bottom edge right there, and then hit OK. And so we'll see it's going to go one inch deep. All right, so it's a one inch through right-handed thread, quarter 20. So I'll go next. Uh, by default, when we choose this, it gives us a center drill, a drill, a chamfer drill, and then a tap. There is also an option for doing a counterbore tap. So a counterbore tap would have the counter, it uses a counterbore drill to go in and and uh, cut that. I'm going to end up doing those little counterbores I got with a small end mill. I'm hoping I can use the, um, the 3 16 or whichever one I have in there. So I'm not going to put a chamfer drill on here. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm just going to run the center drill, the drill, and the tap. Again, the 
when we tell it it's a quarter 20, Bobcat, it's going to, whatever center drill we put in, it's going to pick. But it's going to pick the drill that we have set up through our thread library for the drill. So it's going to pick a 201 drill, even though that hole, as I measured it, measured at a quarter inch, it's always going to drill the hole to whatever um, drill size is inside your thread library. So if you're not sure which one it is, under the cam tab up here, when you click it, there's a thread library. You can open it up. You can go to the specific thread you're, you're questioning and double click on it. And at the bottom, it'll have a, a section that says holes and then it'll say cutting uh, uh, drill or something like that, or a cutting tap or rolling tap, something like that. And in that little box, it'll tell you what drill is going to be picked whenever you pick that specific, um, what's it called? Thread type. So quarter 20, whatever you got. So I'm going to do a center drill, drill tap, go next. Right here, we got our machine sequencing. I always leave it on optimized if that's an option. So next again. Right here, posting, we got work offset one. Next again. Center drill. So it's grabbing my 3 8 90 degree spot. I'll go next. Uh, parameters, uh, I'll go with a center diameter of, actually, I'm 160 is fine. Um, hole's going to be 201 by the time it's getting drilled. So yeah, 160 is fine. I'll, uh, I'll do that in a single step. It's only going in 80 thou. Right here's my drill, and there it is, the 201 drill. So it's made specifically, you know, this is the, the right one to use. You might use a 203 or depending on what kind of fitment you want. You know, a 201 leaves, what is it, like 75% threads, something like that. There's If you if you ever see the program G-Wizard, you can actually go in there and see different drill sizes and, and the percentage of thread that they leave. Um, when you're doing your stuff. So 201 is most common. I'll leave it there. Right here for the drill, we'll see the, the total depth was, uh, what, one inch? I think, yeah, one inch. So because I said it was a through hole, it adds the 50 thousandths on. And then the overall depth, the 1.1104, that's where the tip of the tool is going to go. That's what you'll see inside the code. So I'll go next. Right here's my quarter 20 tap. All right. One big thing to note about your taps, and this they, they could be a little different than this, is the ineffective number of threads right there. What this is saying is we have four ineffective threads at the bottom. So four threads that don't cut the threads properly. They're the tip of it, you know, whatever it is. They're not full threads. So if you know your uh if you know your pitch for your thread, which is uh your um, it's one inch divided by your number of passes, right? So one divided by 20, 50 thou. So the pitch for a quarter 20 hole is 0 0.05. So if I take 0 0.05 and I multiply it by four, that's 200 thousandths, all right? So 200 thousandths of my hole where I'll have ineffective threads that if I don't drill the hole properly, I could jam up in the bottom and and there's a lot that could go wrong. So yours might not have four ineffective threads. It might have two. It might have three, you know, whatever it is. So when I hit next, you have your effective depth, which is the one inch. We don't add any extra onto the under the tap with this. And then the overall depth has that added 200 thousandths in, that extra ineffective thread length. So that's where that extra value is coming from. And this is a through hole tap, so I'm not really too worried about it. But if this was a blind tap, We'd have to be very careful doing this. We'd have to come in and either adjust the depth that our drill goes, or we'd have to adjust adjust the depth of the the tap. So whichever you'd have to you'd have to work one of them out. Uh, one would have to be uh, probably a little bit shorter, uh, and that's really only something you're going to run into with blind taps. But just be aware that that's the kind of stuff that can happen. So when I'm all done with the uh, tap, I can hit compute. And it's uh, it's a quick one. Just just going to run through there uh, just like that. So there's our threaded holes, all eight of them. I will blank that out. I forgot to do that chamfer in the middle. We got to throw that on there real quick. Uh, so before I go and do the chamfer, I'm going to knock out these little counter bores here. So before I do that, I'm going to go to evaluate. I'm going to say measure one. And I'm just going to pick this uh, radius or, or pick that that part right there. And I'll see that the diameter is 0.375. So I should have a tool, my 3 16 tool should fit in there nicely uh, to cut. 
So the way I do this one is uh, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. I like to do it with a profile rough. All right, so I'm gonna right click on machine setup two. I'm gonna do a mill two axis and I'm gonna select my geometry. Now I wanna, I wanna make it kinda, kinda funky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna program one of these. So I'll just pick this guy right here. Top of features at zero. Total depth will go in and pick the bottom of that pocket right there. And I'll go ahead and hit okay. Well, let's check the chain direction right quick. Yep, to the left puts us inside, that's good. And I'll say next, feature page, depth, geometry, all that fun stuff. I'm gonna do a profiling. I'm not gonna use a finish pass on this one. Uh, I don't think I, I think we'll be fine. So I'll get rid of that, go next. No changes for the tabs, no changes for the posting. And then right here, pick that 3 tool for me. So I'll go next. Uh, now this is the big reason why I didn't uh, want the finish pass. The finish pass just plunges in and cuts. It is something we, ah, you know what? I'm gonna put a finish pass on it because I wanna show you guys that too. So let me put the finish back in here. All right, so here's our, our 3 16 flat. Uh, I'll say, I wanna do a contour ramp down this thing. So I'll say contour ramping. I want my compensation all set to the left. And then right here, we have our side allowance. Now the side allowance can affect everything we do. Uh, we got a 3 8 hole, we got a 3 16 tool. We should have room, but really you gotta think of that 3 8 hole as 30,000 smaller. So if the tool can't fit, if you were to subtract 30 thousandths from that 3 8 if the tool that you decide to pick is bigger than that, you can't use it. It's not gonna fit in the hole. So I think we'll be good with 15 thou. We'll find out here in a second. Uh, total depth is going a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna say, let's do that in eighth inch per pass cuts. All right, so I'll go next. All right, here's my leads, just gonna kind of plunge in. It's already kind of doing what I want. It's, it's ramping in and cutting down. So I'm not worried about the way that it gets in. Uh, we could potentially, again, this is a rough pass. I kind of ran into this earlier. You could go in and set up compensation now, but really you wanna save compensation for your finish steps. So I don't really have a good lead in or lead out to use on this because there's just not that much good, you know, not much good to do. So I'll leave it on vertical. I'm not gonna get a G41, but I will get a G41 when I do my finish pass. So I'll go next, got the corner types, no changes. Sequencing, just gonna say, optimized and apply it to all the other operations, advanced feeds, and then the finish tool. So go up to the tool crib, pick that 3 16 flat. Right here's our pattern. So now I'll do my left left. Parameters, no changes there. This is a finish pass. And then leads. So for the leads on this one, I'm gonna do a right angle lead. And if you guys remember from earlier, there's an easy way to always get right down the center. Take the whole diameter, minus the tool diameter and whatever's left over divide it by two so now when, when we do our rough we'll kind of spiral down and cut the uh the, the counter bore and then when we do our finish it's going to plunge right down the middle feed to the wall make that final cut and call it a day so next nothing else really to change in here so we'll hit compute and there it is little spiral down gets to the bottom one more little finish pass as part of the rough pass. The rough actually does level everything out. And then we do our finish pass. That's partially why I said we might be able to, you know, you might be able to skip doing your, um, your finish pass. Because when you use this contour ramp, it kind of naturally, when it gets down to the bottom, it runs one kind of finish pass. And if all you're doing is hiding a bolt head, it usually works. Um, but there it is. There's one of them. So the reason I only did one of them, really all I could do, all I'd have to do to do all eight of them would be to pick the geometry, all eight holes, uh, all eight counter bores. But another feature that some of you guys may not know about is a tool path pattern. All right, if you haven't used the tool path pattern before, they're very, uh, very cool features. So I'm gonna rename this. I'm just gonna call this C bore. And then I'm gonna right click on that specific feature. And right down here, we have an option called add toolpath pattern. So I'm gonna pick that. And then right here's our four different types of, of toolpath patterns that we can create. So we have an array where we're essentially laying out a grid. It's, uh, it's, an, yeah, it's an incremental kind of movement. Um, so it's here's where my first part is. 
I want to make another one four inches away. And I want to make another one four inches away. And you can make like a grid of parts. So if you got a big, uh, you know, a sheet of material that you want to get 10 parts out of, you could actually go in without programming 10 of the same part. You could just go in and kind of copy all the tool paths for it. Uh, we also have a translate option, which this is more of an absolute kind of move. It's not something I would do, but it is something you could use. It's it's very handy on uh, routers, uh, but it takes a lot of setup to make this work. Essentially, you have your part sitting in a known location, and you want to cut or cut another one in another known location. That's the big thing. It's a known location, and you just tell it X, Y, Z how far to move. The right way to really do something like this, though, would be to use a work offset. You know, do your first part with a G54. And then do the same part, but a G55 in another location that you define. The problem is I've had guys try and run this tool path and they'll have two vices on the machine. So they're going to be, you know, they want to go from this vice over to a different vice. So, you know, from here to here. And uh, in Bobcad, they have it set up a very specific distance apart. And it's, it's something you could measure. But at the machine, it, even a minor discrepancy in how much, you know, where your vices are sitting at can ruin everything so translate's not one that i use too often um you know not too much uh rotate allows me to rotate a tool path that's the one we're going to use here in a minute and then points is uh kind of a general purpose you could do kind of absolute lo known locations uh, we could even use points on the one we're on the part we're working on now uh, essentially what points allows us to do is you pick a start point you say i want to take everything from the middle of this hole and and I want to move it. And you'd have points in the center of all, you know, eight of these holes. So you have kind of your start point, And this is the tool path that gets copied. And then you pick all the other positions you want us to output that tool path at. And that's a really quick way of doing it. Um, but for us, the rotate's much faster. So I'll go with rotate, say next. Right here, you have an option for 3D. Uh, the 3D option is really for um, rotary work or five axis work, it's it's for multi-axis stuff. So it's not something you're gonna do too often. In our case, we're just gonna set our angle as 360 divided by eight. And then the way that you do copies, and this is pretty, I can't think of another time you wouldn't do it this way, but it, for Bobcad, the way that we handle copies is you take the total number that you need. So in our case, it's eight holes, and you subtract the number that you've programmed. So eight minus one it's usually minus one is seven so we need seven copies and that's going to leave the original and then copy it seven times our origin our rotation axis we're going to just say uh pick here um i believe i have an arc somewhere if i turn on this guy i just want to pick essentially a point that's right at xyz zero here so just like that and i'll hit okay because you'll notice we're at a, a rotation axis of three and minus 3.5. Why did we get that? Well, because our origin's in the corner of the part. If our origin was was dead center on, maybe we use the, the center hole that we've already cut in. If we had used that as our origin, then these values would read at zero. But this distance that we get right here is the distance from the um, origin to the center of rotation, which for me, the center of rotation is dead center on the part. So lucky for us, we had that one inch hole there. Otherwise, I would have had to cancel out of this, made a point, put it at, you know, in the center of the geometry and then selected it. So now I'll just hit OK. And what did I do wrong there? Oh, I see what I did. So here's what I did wrong. I, I accidentally did a tool path pattern for the entire uh, machine setup. So let me delete that guy real quick. Let me do it specifically for the counter bore. I could have sworn I did that, but all right, next. So again, we'll go with uh, 360 divided by eight. We'll do seven copies and I'll just repick the point in the middle. Okay, and okay. And there we go. Because we have that bolt hole pattern, it'll run them all around. I don't think that's any faster than just picking the, the geometry and picking the geometry is definitely going to be more consistent, uh, but it is a nice feature. If you got a, a part that you want to do a bunch of copies of different cuts onto, that's a really good feature to do it. All right. Uh, last thing to do. 
is the chamfer, I believe. I think that's the last uh, part of this. So the way that I'm going to do this chamfer is I'm going to open up my machine setup one. I'm going to find a feature that has the chamfer on it. And I'm going to copy the whole feature. Now, I don't need the pocket and the profile, but the chamfer, it comes along with the chamfer. So for now, I'll just take it with me. I'm going to paste it right here. Do I wish to use the same top and depth? Uh, yeah, sure. It doesn't matter. Before I go and start actually doing the tool path now, I'm going to right click and say edit. Go down to the machining strategy tab. Ooh, right here. And I'm going to get rid of the pocket and I'm going to get rid of the profile finish. So I'll close that out, get rid of that, get rid of that, leaving me just that chamfer mill, which for us should be all set up. We shouldn't have to mess with much. And then I'll just say finish. Now over here for geometry, I'm just going to right click and say reselect. And I'm just going to pick this edge right here. Now the problem we're going to run into, and I'll, I'll do it so you guys can see it, is if I hit OK on here and I go and compute this tool path, we end up with this chamfer that's way up here. And the reason we get it way up there is because, well, it's thinking that the top of the part's still up here. So it's going down whatever the 40 thousandths or something. And it's, uh, and it's putting it down. So for me, what I got to do is edit this feature. And I'm going to tell it to pick the top. And I'll just pick the top right on that edge there. Or you could pick that edge over there. And then really, I don't need it to go that deep. I'll just say, let's go, you know, 0.125. It's, it doesn't even use this depth, just so we're all clear. Uh, when I hit OK on this, and I go down to the parameters page of that chamfer, that's where the depth is set at. So really, when you're doing a, especially a chamfer and a corner round, whenever you're using one of those two tool paths, the depth that's set here is based on the top of the part that you pick. So in this case, since I have that pocket in the part, I need to make sure to tell it that the top is down lower. So just going to compute it. And there it is. That looks better inside the, uh, the piece of geometry. All right, there we go. Is that everything? I believe so. I think that's everything. So let me turn off all this extra geometry. Uh... What layer is that on? Oh, I must have had it on that layer. All right, let me move this to my other layer. So put that on stock open pocket real quick and cancel out. So there it is. That's the entire job. So far, we're going to simulate it still, make sure it all looks good. But remember, save your part. And then we can go in and start that simulation. So we'll say start. And when the simulation loads, uh, I did my facing. All right, so I'm gonna let it run the whole way. You will see the part eventually kind of flip over and start running upside down. Why won't you move? Give me a second. So I don't know what's going on. I, I got my simulation. It's like stuck right here. Let me go up. Oh, I got to do the other one. Eh, found it. Okay. So the, uh, here it is. So I like to have this thing over on the side. It's one of the most helpful things. You can fast forward through your simulation using this. One note about fast forwarding through your simulation. When it's fast forwarding, it's not doing any collision checking. It's not checking to make sure nothing, you know, the holder or whatever's not touching the part. So right here on your report tab, if you fast forward through something, you'll get an error saying, we're not doing collision checking. If there's a collision where like the flute cuts into an area on the part that it's not supposed to, I do it all the time with leads. I accidentally set a lead that's too big and swing around back into my part. Those will still show up uh, as red. They're, they're, they're seen as areas where that, that was not supposed to happen. So the simulation try to tell you, hey, that's not right. But you will miss things if you fast forward through them. So what I tell people is, Fast forward through it all you want, but before you pay, before you post that code for the final time, before you bring it out to the machine, run the entire simulation. Just let the whole thing run so that when you're done, if, it, if, it, if it's a long run in one, run it, go get a cup of coffee or whatever you got to do. Come back when it's all done, you can rotate around the part and see what results you got. And that's a big one. So right here, we're just going to hit play. 
and I'm not going to run it too fast because everything seems to run. I don't know what I did to this. It runs faster now than it ever did. So let that run. There's our face pass for the top. All the same stuff we've seen already. So here it goes. One other thing I could do, and I didn't really, um, I haven't talked about it yet, is the machining order. Um, right now, it's it's changing the tools every time it moves to the next stop. But really, I could have uh, you know, drilled that center hole out. I could have done the rough pass of that center pocket and then come and done all this outside stuff with that 5 eighths tool. So I could have done everything I could with the 5 eighths. And then we'll start experiencing more uh, tool changes. But we'll see. Here's our finish pass, our chamfer, our slot, slot, T cutter, T cutter, profile around the outside. We got our corner round. And then when this finishes, we got to flip it over and we go, oh, we got a little collision right there. What's that from? All right, we'll have to look at that, see what collision that came from. I didn't know. I don't know when I when that happened. It might be a lead in. We'll find out. So here's now the bottom side. Once again, this is that face that's going to make our zero. So at the machine, you're going to jog Z down, touch off the rough stock. You know, after you know your measurement, we know this thing has to be 1.75 when it's done. So then you'll jog down whatever you need to to make it 1.75. Let that face it across. And, uh, and then we go to our pocket. So this is starting on the outside. You will see a little air cutting here. Uh, the reason we're getting air cutting, ooh, we gotta go deeper, don't we? Yeah, we do. Forgot we didn't take off all that material there. So we're gonna send this a bit deeper on this guy, but uh, we'll speed it up. So let that run, let that run. All right, so two fixes so far. We got that little gouge in the bottom uh, that we can see right there, and we gotta send this tool deeper. Shouldn't hurt anything though. Let that cut it all away. Then we cut that star-shaped pocket in there. Clean it up. Center drill, drill, tap, counter bore, and chamfer. All right, so the two problems we have. What caused this? All right, so let's go look at the part and find out what we did wrong. So before I go too crazy into that, this is the, uh, uh, let's rename this, uh, rename. So we'll say bottom center hole chamfer. All right, and blank that out. All right, so let's see, we did our, our stock open pocket here, which has our rough pass on it. And I don't see anything that looks like it's cutting into it. I'm not. 100% sure where it is anyway. Let's go to our profile finish though. That all looks fine. So what else would have hit it? Oh, I found it. There it is right there. That connection between the two start points or its end point, whatever that is. Clipping the wall right there with that tool. So pretty easy fix. The reason that happened is because of our top of job. I have my top of part set right here. So if I open up this slot, the, the top of feature is set to point minus 0.75. So the rapid plane is based on our top of feature. So from that minus 0.75, we're just lifting up 200 thousandths and then rapiding across the part. So had we not watched the simulation and that happened, that what size that 3 16 tool is dusted. As soon as it touches a part, it's gonna be gone. So the way that I do this, if we ever run into this, there's times you don't have to worry about this just because there's no geometry in the way. Again, look at the simulation, see if it's gonna do it. But what you can do to make sure that you get the same um, retract points, you're always going to the same, same height. Whenever you set up your top of feature, if it's a negative value, add that negative value to your rapid plane. So in this case, I'll just say plus 0.75. And then the feed plane is going to stay at a at hundred thousandths because what's going to happen is even though we're now rapiding at 950 high, you know, 0.2 above the top of the part, we don't want to start feeding from there. We want it to wrap it down to the feed plane, which is just a hundred thousandths above the top of part. And then it's going to start feeding in. 
So now we can hit compute. And uh, here's our profile rough. You'll see it's now much taller, clear in that section. Uh, and then we don't have anything on the finish pass anyway, so it didn't matter. But there it is. So we fixed that little guy. Uh, and then the depth of the, the open pocket here, I just got to edit this. Uh, we're going 0. 0.75. Let me just go 1.125. Uh, we'll go 1 and an eighth and compute. And that shouldn't really affect anything. It could, depending on where we got our jaws at, but depending on how we're holding this, well, we could play around with it. But yeah, if we're holding on to say like this section of the uh, the part, you know, this is kind of the vice jaw here, vice jaw over here. Um, you know, depending on where the vice jaws are, we could potentially hit them. So we'd have to definitely think about that. Um, you know, just just got to figure out how we're going to do it. You know, there we go. So there was that issue. Um, I believe that's all of them. So I just want to talk about, does anyone in here, I mean, you could answer if you want, but if you don't have a tool changer, uh, you go ahead and raise your hand if you want, just so I know kind of what we're working with. If you have a tool changer, there's you have kind of the best of both worlds. So if I right click on milling job here and I go to my machining order, this will allow me to set up the order that everything runs in. And by default, the way I have it set up right now is I have it set to individual feature. Uh, just to show you guys this really quick, uh, if you go right here to cam defaults and you go down to current settings, um, right down, where is it? Where did they put that? Right here under posting, where did they put that thing? Uh, never mind, I could have sworn... But they added that in. Give me a second. Let me see if it was just a specific machine. Current settings. If I pick my uh, one of these. Am I? Hold on one second, guys. There is a section. Oh, wait. Hold on. It's in the settings. So system settings. Uh, you have general settings, customized ribbon, customized shortcut. So if I go to document default. I got my units, got my display, got my CAD, the settings for CAD, dimensions, and then down here we have CAM. This is what I was looking for, sorry guys. So it's inside the settings, which is this little, uh, it's a little window with a gear on it, right just to the left of your undo button. Right here is your default machining order for every kind of job you have in Bobcad. So you have a milling job, turning job, wire EDM, mill turn jobs, and then we also have one for probing. Um, so right now, my milling jobs all define as individual feature, meaning whatever order I put this in the cam tree, that's the order that's going to run, all right? But you could change that on the fly. Again, that's my default. So if I right-click here and I go to my machining order, I could see what it looks like if I said do everything with an individual tool. Now, there's individual tool, and there's individual tool per machine setup. Individual tool by itself allows us it, it's kind of uh it's good for using uh if you're doing uh two vices i don't know why i keep saying us so much it's good for when you're using two vices because you could say i want to go rough everything out with my five ace tool on my left vice my g54 vice and on my g55 vice i want to use that same tool and let it cut whatever it can on the other side so you could get it to work on two parts at the same time without doing tool changes between it so individual tool is going to do it that way but for us, we don't have a, a two vices next to each other. We're going to do one part and one vice, and then we're going to flip the part over and do the other side. So we definitely do not want machine setup two operations to start happening when we're still cutting the top side. And that's what the individual tool per machine setup is going to do. So if I say individual tool and I hit OK, you'll see we've got machine setup one, machine setup two, machine setup one that's gonna cause major issues. So we can go over here and say individual tool per machine setup. And then this is pretty much, uh, it's it's gonna be very close to what, I mean, it's grouping the tool together. So we're gonna do everything we can with our five ace tool, that's tool number one. Then we're gonna do our center drill, our drill. Uh, we're gonna size it up with whatever size tool we use. I thought that was the five ace, have to look. Oh no, that's our finish tool. No, that's our chamfer mill, sorry, looking at it all wrong. Then you'll see we go back to our profile finish. Then we do our chamfer mill. Then we do our slot and T cutters and all that stuff. And then we get down here and we get into machine setup too. 
So it really just depends on how you guys want to run it. Uh, if you watch it in the simulation and you see something you don't like, it's it's in the wrong order. The machining order can reorganize that, and you can actually reorganize things manually and say, you know what, this this uh, where is this chamfer mill that I got here? I don't want that to run then. I want it to move down. I want to do all my chamfers at the end. Whatever you want to do. Uh, like I said, I like to leave it on individual feature here. Uh, because it's going to change the tool. It's going to run in the order I expect to see it in. Uh, again, if you guys don't have a tool changer, you're going to want to probably play around with these settings a little bit. And uh, yeah, when I'm done, I can hit OK. And uh, let's go ahead and run the simulation one final time. And we should, should have a nicely cleaned part. So I'm saving it real fast, just like always, before you start the simulation, give it a save and then start. All right, and when the simulation launches, final time, I'm gonna zip through this a little bit quicker. I'll keep it on a pretty consistent speed this time. So we got our face pass, center drill, drill, open up the pocket, finish, chamfer, open pocket there. Oh, just cleaning it up. We have options with that toolpath too. We could totally just convert that to a, a high speed machining strategy. And then we wouldn't have as many lifting moves. I mean, you're still going to have a lot of uh, rapid retract moves. That's just how it goes. But you could potentially get rid of a bunch of them. Um, get rid of a bunch of those, those lift moves. There's that guy. There's our slot. It made it clear past that corner. I saw it lift up. Then it just runs its way around, puts our fillet in. Ooh, got to flip the part over. Almost forgot. There's our face pass again. And then now it's taken off the full amount. So when it's done with this, it should be... Uh, should be clean. And again, every one of the tool paths that you're seeing where I'm doing a full depth, if you're not comfortable with that, all it is is going into that feature and putting in a uh, a depth of cut. Just add whatever you're comfortable with on your depth of cut. There we go. So there is our part. So again, we could go in, we could turn on our visibility and turn on our workpiece. And we can see all of it. So let me do my deviation again like I did earlier. Uh, let's move this guy back up. Oh, I wanted to show you guys this because I do this all the time. If you ever mess up a window and you accidentally lose something over here, because uh, I do it all the time where I'll accidentally close down, you can get them back by going up to the view tab and just turning them back on. But if you really mess up your screen, which I've done many a times before, moving boxes, you move a box, it doesn't remount again. Uh, there's this reset button right here. You just say on the view tab, reset. And it'll reset this whole kind of user interface for you in case you ever run into it. So again, I'm going to go down here to analysis. I'll do my deviation right there. And so for this one, I'm going to say uh, I want to go between minus, um, let's say 20 thou and plus 20 thou, just like so. And so if we look at this, let me move this screen up again this way. So if we look, we got seven numbers. Let's do this a little bit more. Let's go 11 numbers. All right, so if this thing, when we refresh this, if the part turns green, we'll see right there, we're in a pretty good spot. All right, and that's that's the color we're shooting for. You know, I'm, I'm okay with blue, you know, the cyan, maybe a little yellow, but that's starting to get us a little bit, bit out of bounds, depending on what our tolerances are. So I'll go ahead and say refresh. And then I'm going to hide the um, workpiece once again, just hide that whole thing. And there it is. A green part is a, is a clean part. Oh, I like that. Green part's a clean part. So there it is. That's our deviation. There's nothing on here that's showing me that I should have anything out of, out of you know, within a thou uh, is where we're at. So not too shabby. Uh, well, I guess within two thou, but 
from minus 001 to plus 001. And you can always adjust this even more. You can make this value even higher. So we could see right now, like right here, if I refresh this and the whole thing comes out green, oh, there we go. So now you're seeing more of a deviation on it. And so you could see like the, anything that's showing up as the yellow color is within three tenths. It's pretty good. It's overall very good. Uh, nice clean cut on there. Um, so I'll take it. I will take it inside this hole. Uh, I don't know which color blue that is, but there we go. All right, so I'll close it down. So I'm just going to run through kind of the finishing steps of, all right, we've 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 just finished our part. Now it's time to bring it out to the machine. What steps do we take at the end of this whole thing? When I'm done with this, I'll open up some time for you guys to ask some questions. So if you have some questions, start thinking about them now. Um, but really, we just simulated the part. We've, we've got all the tool path done. Everything looks pretty good. I'm, I'm really happy with the deviation and everything that came out. I'm, I'm good with it. Let's do this. First thing to double check would be feeds and speeds. All right. Remember, I didn't really go through any feeds and speeds during this, but you'd want to go in and make sure you got all your feeds and speeds. It's, it's one of the things that I've met many people that they kind of go through parts the same way I just was going through it. And so as they're doing it, they forget to put feeds and speeds in. And there's nothing worse than bringing a tool out there and uh, find it out that the Bobcad speed and feed that it picked had you set up at, you know, 5,000 or I had one in here that was uh, a 10,000 RPM uh, thing. Is it the chant the corner round? One of the weird ones. So right there, the spindle RPM of 77.6. Well, if my machine's only got... Uh, 6,000 RPM, I'm going to get an error at the machine just because of that. So you can go into each individual you know, feature. Like I could go into mill facing and say edit and then go to the tooling page and I could set the feeds and speeds there. Or in, I, I can't remember if 32 has it, but 33 for sure, we have these little arrows that stick out right here. I'm pretty sure 32 has it. We have these arrows that stick out all over. Yeah, 32 has it for sure. So when you expand a feature, you get to see the operation that builds that feature. And if you hover over the arrows that are on that operation, one of the options right down here is your feeds and speeds. You could come in here and say, oh, I'm not running at you know 6,000 RPM. I'm going to run at 4,500. And I'm going to run at 50 inches a minute. And I want to plunge at 25. All right. So then you say apply. Shrink that one up and go to the next one. So for my center drill, all I'd have to do is uncheck. There it is. The center drill had that 10,000 spindle RPM. So for this one, I could say it's going to go 6,000 and, you know, 17 inches or whatever. So if you remember to set up your feeds and speeds as you're going through the features, great. Do it that way. That's absolutely the best way of doing it. Um, if you are completely stuck and don't know how to set up feed rates, uh, I would strongly recommend there's a lot of programs out there. Uh, there's even ones, there's even feeds and speeds calculators you can find on your phone. Um, you can, I can't remember what they're all called, but you can go on like the iOS or the Google, Google store or whatever, the play store or whatever, and look up feeds and speeds calculators. I've found a few of them. None of them have been <clears throat> as good as uh, G wizard. Just me personally, uh, I don't work with that guy at all. I'm not getting paid to say this. The guy makes <coughs> a very, very well put to put together program. It's a little confusing for the first little while, and then you kind of get used to it. And it's uh, it's a great program um, just for feeds and speeds. If you're if you're a, a, a real life machinist and you got you know you go by sound and all that stuff, then you probably have some numbers that you're going to start with. You're going to run from. You know, when you're used, when you're cutting aluminum, you might have some go-to numbers that you use, and then you dial it in from there. So, yeah, just remember to put your feeds and speeds in. That's the step I've had many, many people miss, and then they get to like the the next step of posting and all that stuff, and they got the wrong feeds, and yeah, it screws up everything. So after we double check our feeds and speeds, after we've done our simulation, after everything's all done, uh, there's kind of like really two main things you do last. Uh, Save your part, you know, make sure that that's always part of it. But you post your code, and if you want it, you generate a setup sheet. All right, so let's start by posting the code. I'm going to right-click on my milling job and say post. All right, so that's as simple as it is. The code that shows up over here is the entire set of code for the entire job. 
Some of you guys might not want the entire job, but just two separate ops, the top and the bottom. It all depends on how you want to run it. Uh, if I can find the middle of this, which is going to be pretty far down at some point, I don't know where it's at. Um, down here, keep going. Looking for a gap. When we output both of the ops at the same time, uh, we'll see this is still machine setup one here, so I'll keep going down. Machine setup one. Uh, this posted code has this MO1 and apparently double MO5s in it, but this MO1 right here is my optional stop, so I could have the option to stop in between each feature if I wanted to. Uh, when we go to machine setup two, should be right down here. Next cut right there. Where are you? There it is, machine setup two. So when machine setup two comes up, we get to the end of our uh, our outside profile cut, and then we output an M00, an actual stop command. So that's gonna output the stop. You could walk out to the machine, flip the part over, re-zero, and then just hit go and start cutting again, um, which is fine. That works. It's not the way I like to do it. I get, it's not that it's even confusing. I just feel like I could keep track of things better. So the way that I do it, let me shrink up all these tool paths I got here. So the way that I do it is I would right click on machine setup two and say post yes, no. All right, then I'm gonna right click on my milling job and say post. This is now when I do a save as uh, right there, this is going to be op one, save. So now I have just the top part saved as a set of code. And then if you want, uh, this is what I do, I then give myself a nice view of the top. So the view I use is the ISO 2 view here. So I'm looking at the top. And then you could go over here to your settings and over here to the current document, to the display. And all I'm doing here is I'm going to hide the axis X, Y, and the nomen. So I could say apply and OK. And so I just have my part on the screen. Now, if I left click, Again, left click, you're not right clicking on this one. You left click on the machine setup one, you'll see your origin. So if you really wanna make it better, you unblank your stock and you show your origin. So look at that. Now we have a, a way of knowing exactly where the origin is gonna be. We see where X is, we see where Y is, we see where Z is. And now I go up to the top, I say, generate a setup sheet. And there's a bunch of setup sheets. If you just want a tool list, you have tool lists down here. But for me, I always use the, the full setup sheet and I hit OK. And when it does that, it eventually pops up inside of uh, Internet Explorer here. It's got the name of the file. It's got the, the all the ops. It's got everything broken down. You'll see we only have one setup because we did that post yes, no. I got a beautiful picture of my part that's going to show me exactly where that origin is supposed to be at. So I have a reminder of that. Down here, I have whatever material set up. I didn't change the material. So I got 6061 set up as my material. I got my stock size. I got a list of all my tools with the protrusion lengths on every single one of them. And then I have a breakdown of each tool path with the feeds and speeds and everything else listed. By the end of this job, if you do everything right, you should be able to give another person your code and this setup sheet, as long as you did everything right, this setup sheet and that set of code should be enough to tell that guy what he's got to do. Um, you might need to hold some hands on that a little bit longer, but I've done that many times with many customers where I could program something. You know, we'll do it during an online training, and all I have to do is give them the part, which they're probably not modifying. That's the reason I'm, I give it to them. So I give them the part. I give them the um, the setup sheet and the code. And they, they take it and run with it. So, you know, play around with it. See what you think. There's my setup sheet. The way that I save setup sheets is by right-clicking inside of here. And then I go down and do a print. Now, if you got Windows 10, you have this printing function. So as soon as this thing pops up, there's an option in there called Microsoft Print to PDF. If you're not using Windows 10, you're using something older, there is programs that you could download that add a virtual printer to your computer. One of them that I used to use was called Qt, like C-U-T-E, Qt PDF. Free program, you download it, you install it, and it adds the ability to save as PDFs here. But all you do is say print, and then 
right there. I'll go to my uh, folder that I put all this stuff in, repeat to axis. This is going to be example one, tool path, op one. Make sure to get rid of the file extension if you take it because it's going to save as a PDF. And I can say save. So that's got op one done. Then I come into the feature again. I post yes, no on my machine setup one. And I post yes, no on my machine setup two. And I'm just going to go ahead and flip my part over and get myself a good view of the bottom side of this part now. So something like that. And then once again, we can post the code. Do that first, I guess. So I'll say save as. Just going to call this one op2. And while I'm here, I'm actually going to grab that. And I'm going to copy that label. Because I'm going to use that same name when I, when I name my setup sheet here in a second. So I'll just say save. And then left click on my machine setup again generate my setup sheet now you can't generate your setup sheet from the milling job up here if you're trying to leave that origin there uh, that's why i have to go from here i click on this then i go and generate my setup sheet right there full setup sheet okay again all the ops you got the picture give it a print and uh print to pdf okay print and then paste the name Ooh. and then save. So when I'm all done, I now have a folder right here. Oh yeah, there it is. I have a folder and inside this folder, I have my example parts. Well, this also has the, here, let me do this. This is from, uh, let's go folder. Um, let's do webinar. All right, webinar there. So like this all the way up to here and then this right here. I'm going to take all that and put it in the webinar folder. The rest of this stuff was all the part files I sent you guys earlier. So this is everything we made today. Uh, we have a part file that has all the tool path on it. So we only have one file instead of having two, one for the top and one for the bottom. We have PDFs for our uh, different ops and we have NC code for both ops. So a really good way of, of keeping everything organized. And I, this is my favorite method. Do all your tool pathing on one part. It does get big. It makes the file bigger. Uh, you'll see this is, uh, you know, it's actually still not that bad. Two and a half uh, megabytes or so. So, yeah, there it is. There's our job. And then, yeah, we take these these NC codes out to the machine. And you could just directly print from the, from the uh, Internet Explorer as well. But like I said, if you save it as a PDF, you just double click it and open it up with uh, either Adobe if you got it or Google Chrome can open up uh, and uh, PDF files, no problem. So there it is. Boom, get out of here. All right. Uh, I planned on doing two parts today, but uh, <laughs> that didn't happen. So this is the part. I don't know when the next time I'll be doing this uh, this training. So we'll do uh, I'll try and get what, me or one of the boys to do one of these parts something like this or if you guys have some ideas for certain kinds of parts you want to see uh send me an email uh all, everyone that's in here you guys got those part files earlier today if you if you got the part files you should have um if you reply to that email and you say hey I got this part this is what I'm trying to do I think it'd be a good one for the for the class uh or whatever it could be a three axis part two axis part if you're okay with us using them Feel free to email it to me and uh, either me or Darren or Andrew, when we do one of these events, we'll, we'll use it. We'll try and use that part if we can, if it fits into something. So there we go. All right. So I'm pretty much done talking. We got about 20 minutes left. I'm just going to leave it open for questions. So if you guys have any questions, just type them in. Let me know what you're running into. Uh, otherwise, I did record this whole thing. It is going to go up on the website. Um when I fig finish everything, I gotta I gotta separate it because it doesn't break at lunch. So it's all recorded.